Okay, so good afternoon to everybody. Thank you very much for being so punctual. I, uh, we know it's not easy to leave restaurants and, uh, and be here on time, so congratulations. Um, and uh, we are then going on to the second lap in our uh, summer school today after a wonderful session, which we would like to thank for this morning. Uh, enormous source of inspiration. We are also very happy that it was very interactive, so um, Albert's uh, words really uh, worked wonderfully. Very, very good interaction. We hope it continues this afternoon. We sure it will. Uh, so it is a pleasure and an honor for our summer school and in the name of uh, the directors and the organizers, I would like to welcome Professor Fred Genesee with us. Uh, Professor Fred Genesee uh, has a chair at McGill University in psychology, as you probably very well know. Um, he uh, has specialized in uh, child second language acquisition and bilingualism throughout his entire career very well known internationally, published internationally. There is nothing I will say here that you may not know. Uh, perhaps on a more personal note, for those of us who were interested in the field of bilingual child language acquisition, he can be said to be a founding father in the field, um, inspiring enormous amounts of students uh, and researchers and doing very, very serious work in this field together with other colleagues uh, in, in Canada. Um, to be brief, perhaps the two main areas in which he has uh, worked uh, more consistently are uh, the areas of second language acquisition in early childhood and bilingualism within educational context and the very special educational context that take place in, in Canada with immersion programs where he has uh, looked at um, the acquisition of lexis, the acquisition of syntax, from theoretical perspective, that is a generative grammar perspective, but also other perspectives, but always trying to find, uh, to study the situation in education and to find solutions, if one can talk about solutions, or at least, at least paths of uh, um, ways to deal with uh, the educational issues that come up in, in our diverse society with immigration kids, with diverse levels in, in classrooms, heterogeneous um, profiles in students and, and uh, in, in pupils, right? So this is where he did most work on having an impact in the immersion programs in Canada, together with, of course, other, other colleagues uh, there. Um, the other f area where he has been uh, a pioneer and has led pioneer work is in the very interesting area of adopted children and how they develop linguistically and uh, how they, uh, of course, adjust in the educational settings in which they happen to be living after adoption. A very, very interesting area um, that for adopting parents is always crucial and very few universities in the world have actually undertaken this kind of work. So, uh, with no more to say, um, I pass the floor on to Professor Genesee. We are very happy that you could accept our invitation, and uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Carmen. Well, it is a pleasure to be here uh, and to talk about this particular topic. Uh, it's, going, it's going to be quite different in focus from the earlier one. Uh, but you're very fortunate over the week you're going to get a, a real broad uh, view on different aspects of uh, bilingualism. <clears throat> uh, as Carmen said, one of the areas that I worked on is uh, acquisition of uh, languages in the preschool year. My, my interest, I should preface this by saying one of the things that, uh, that unites my various interests in this general topics is looking at children's capacity for language learning. Um, and this will come out very clearly in this talk, but I, I was motivated initially by a, a point of view which was very uh, common at the time that I started research, which was in the last century, uh, was that there are costs to being bilingual. 
There are costs to raising children bilingually, and there are costs to children being educated bilingually. And that was a very prevalent view at the time. And it really uh, sparked my interest in actually raising questions about uh, how children actually acquire two languages, whether it's in a school setting or in the, a preschool setting. And um, I was very lucky to, to be in Montreal. Montreal's a lot like Barcelona. It a, it's a, has a strong uh, minority language, if you like, French, but is also facing a very strong majority language, uh, English. And the dynamics between those two languages are interesting politically, but they also create a perfect work environment for people who are interested in research on bilingualism. One of the things that is very nice about Montreal, and I think this is probably true about Barcelona, is that these are two languages which both enjoy very high status. I may not be, may not be true here, for, but in, in Quebec, even though French is the official language, uh, numerically, English is the dominant language in the country and in the continent, and despite the politics, has a high status among most people. So that's actually important to consider as you listen to me talk about this research and as we talk about that, because in those kinds of environments, you're looking at uh, children's uh, capacity for learning language in an environment which uh, ascribes high status to those two languages. And that has a really, really significant effect on children, their parents, the educational system. Many other areas of the world are bilingual or multilingual, but often there is much higher status assigned to one or several languages opposed to others. So to use Belgium, is anybody from Belgium here? Uh, Belgium is also bi-trilingual, but there are deep divisions over the status of the various languages. And those kinds of effects filter down to families, to school systems, and can have a significant impact on the language learning environment that children are exposed to. And then when you do research on young language learners, you, and you'll see this as I talk about this research, you want to be very, very uh, aware of the, the general uh, context in which they're learning language, because it can have a profound effect on their acquisition of that language. Um, so I'm going to focus on research that has looked at children in the preschool years. <clears throat> but before I start, can I just ask a couple questions about who you are? How many of you, are, you're all graduate students, or most of you, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. You're in, are you, how many of you are in a program that's in education? A few of you. How many of you are in a program of psychology? Most of you. Any linguists? Okay. Okay. Um, and you're all, and you're all, and what stage of your education are you at? Are you at first year of graduate studies? No. A couple? Second year? Third year? Fourth year? Fifth year? Okay, so you're spread out, but those are the third and fourth year. You're well on your way to finishing, I guess. Okay. So what I want to do is... Um, uh, look at bilingual acquisition. Well, as we've seen uh, from the talk this morning, second language acquisition can occur at any time in, in one's life. And uh, I'm going to focus on children who grow up with two languages. Uh, so that at, from birth or even prenatally, uh, they, in most cases, not all children I'm going to talk about are in that situation, but a lot of children who are raised bilingually will have been exposed to two languages before they're even born, but certainly get exposure to two languages or more as soon as they're born or soon after that. And those are the children I'm going to uh, focus on. <clears throat> and there are reasons to, to, to treat this group, at least for research purposes, as a distinct group, because it may well be, and this is an empirical question as well as a theoretical one, that they learn language, in, a second language, in different ways than people who begin to acquire a second language, say, from four or five or six years of age. And I'm going to show you some evidence at the very end, some fMRI data, that shows you that these age differences uh, set in very, very quickly. But I'm going to focus on these children because when I started this research, there had been, there had been a little bit of research on uh, uh, dual language learning in the preschool years, but surprisingly little. I started doing this research in the eight, not late 1980s, early 1990s, 
And with the exception of work by Jürgen Meisel in Germany at the time, uh, there was really virtually no contemporary, and Voltaire and Keschner in Italy, there was virtually no or little research that looked at language acquisition in bilingual children. Most of the research was focusing on monolingual children. And uh, I, was, I got involved in this field because I was asked to write a chapter in a book called De Language Development in Exceptional Circumstances. And uh, they asked me if I would do a, a book on children who were raised bilingually, and I, I had never done anything on this. I don't know why I was asked to do this chapter, uh, but it, I agreed to do it because I thought this would be interesting to do. Um, so I did my, it was relatively easy to do a review of research at that time because there was very little research on it. And the prevailing view at the time, which is a starting point for this story I'm going to tell you, was that when children acquire uh, two languages in, in, at birth, they go through a stage when they have only one, really one system that's made up of both the languages that they're learning. And it's only with time that they actually separate their languages into two linguistic systems. And when I reviewed the research, I didn't see evidence. I didn't think the evidence actually told that story at all, even though that's what the researchers were saying. So I said that in this chapter, and I, uh, I sent the chapter in. I didn't know what the other chapters in the book were until I got a copy of the book. And my, there was my chapter. I think it was like chapter seven. And the other chapters of the book were things like chill, deaf, language development in deaf children, language development in children with Down syndrome, language development in children with alcohol syndrome, uh, syndrome, all of... Uh, so clearly the view was that exceptional circumstances meant, meant children who were at risk for language or general developmental disorders. And at that time, there was this view that learning two languages was similar to that. So I think the editors reluctantly uh, included my chapter, because in the preface there was some remark about Genesee's chapter, that really was sort of swimming upstream on this point of view. So I just want to introduce that notion to you because even though we uh, probably don't feel that way about bilingualism, certainly if you're, you're in a country like Spain or, or, or a city like Barcelona, it's everywhere, but it's still a very, it still can be widely prevalent within the community at large. So I want to start off with the question that why would you actually want to study uh, dual language acquisition. And this is sort of uh, probably obvious for this audience, but I think when you're as graduate students, you always want to ask yourself, why are you doing what you're doing? I just remember I had a, a graduate course that I took from a fellow named Donald Hebb, who's a very famous psychologist, arguably the first cognitive psychologist. And he said, if it's not worth doing, it's not worth doing well. <coughs> because often we have a tendency to think that if it's well done, it's worth doing, and he sort of inculcated this idea that the first question to ask yourself is why are you studying this? So uh, one of the main reasons to look at bilingual acquisition is to understand this form of language acquisition. It's a very uh, widely prevalent form of language development. It's been argued, although we have no real evidence of this, but that there may be more children raised by or multilingually than monolingually. In fact, can you think of any countries that are actually monolingual? Can anybody think of a country? I can think of one, maybe. Can you think of any country in the world where you would say, pretty much this is a monolingual country? I don't mean officially, I mean in terms of the people who actually inhabit that country. I was about to ask. Yeah, officially. there's a lot, I guess. Yeah, but, but in reality. In reality, no, not really. Can anybody? Uh, North Korea. <laughs> yeah. Right. Good point. I had, that was not yes. the one I had in mind. Pardon? Liechtenstein. Liechtenstein? Yes. You think so? Yes, absolutely. Okay, maybe Liechtenstein. Yes. Yeah, there are a lot of the, uh, the, the, the example I thought of was Japan. Because I can't. Is anybody from that area? Are there? Significant language or dialect variations? Yeah, okay. But it's relatively homogeneous linguistically. But yeah, so that's the reason I ask that is because it gives us some evidence that in fact there may be something to this notion that more children are raised in bi or multilingual communities than 
uh, trying to, and so just by sheer numbers alone, they warrant, warrant some kind of investigation. But underlying that, and as researchers, the, the reason for looking at these kinds of murders is that if, you, if we have any claim to uh, working on a theory of language acquisition, uh, if we're only looking at monolingual children, and to a large extent, until in the last 20 years, looking at monolingual English-speaking children, then this theory doesn't have much generalizability. So looking at these children is essential if we want to uh, um, build up the facts about language learning in multiple kinds of circumstances so that we can develop a theory that is generalizable to different kinds of language learning. And I'm not talking about language learning that's unusual. This is really, it's not exceptional, despite the title of that book. It's really very common if, if, uh, if your answers are to be believed. Um, also, and I won't get into this, but looking at uh, dual language learners, bilingual kids, is a way of testing out theories of monolingual acquisition. Because if the theory is valid, then it should explain and apply to children who are acquiring more than one language. Uh, and if not, then maybe it needs to be modified. I once described some of the data that I had on uh, these bilingual children uh, looking at grammatical development. And it was a case of children learning English and French, and they were learning uh, grammatical structures that were incompatible with one another in the two languages. And so I showed it to this linguist colleague of mine who was a generative linguist, Chomsky, who had a very strong theory of language and language learning. And he sort of dismissed these data, even though I thought they were very relevant, because it was about a, a constraint that was contradictory in the two languages. And he just didn't want to dis dis discuss it because from his point of view, the variation you see in these children is only variation. It really isn't substantive enough to really have theoretical implications. Now, I'm not saying all generative linguists would think that, but I think that a good theory has to apply to not only monolingual children and not only to English, but all kinds of language learners. Now, the other point, and this is something that motivates me to quite an extent in all my work, is that given that these children are very prevalent in our community, and more and more so in, in Europe and in North America because of uh, enormous levels of immigration, uh, we need uh, good empirical evidence to provide professionals who work with children who are bi or multilingual. Uh, and I'm, here I'm referring to educators, physicians, clinicians, anybody who comes into contact with a family where the child might be in the process of learning a second language really needs to have good empirical evidence about how these children develop, not just linguistically, but in general, so that they can make uh, proper recommendations. Uh, physicians, for example, are probably the gatekeepers for a lot of clinical services for children. And they're probably providing advice to parents about what to do with their child, even in matters related to language, even though they may know nothing about language. I mean, in, our, in, in, in Canada, often, Parents would be advised by clinicians, doctors, physicians, if they suspect the child has some kind of developmental disorder, Down syndrome, or specific language impairment, and if they're raising the child in Spanish or Arabic, that maybe they should use only English or only French, because exposing the child to two languages with these kinds of difficulties early on in the development is going to add challenges for this child, and he or she doesn't need more. So as you, if you have any kind of clinical interest at all, keep in mind that the, the impact of this kind of research is really quite broad, because it's not just professionals who work with language issues, but it's also uh, uh, physicians uh, as well, and certainly educators. And of course, there's the issue of policymakers, and those of you who live in, in uh, Barcelona know that there's major implications of this research. Uh, with respect to policy and practice. Although, I'm not always convinced as researchers <laughs> we actually have much of an impact on policy. I remember once we were, uh, we applied to do research in a school in my, in my community on uh, looking at the role of phonological awareness and reading acquisition in second language learners. And, we're, and this was a school, this may not be very meaningful to some of you, but this was a school that was very heavily enthusiastic about uh, uh, whole language. The idea that you should teach reading using a meaning-based approach and you should avoid teaching phonics and decoding and all this stuff. It was a very top-down approach to teaching reading 
and it was very popular at the time. And, they, and even though we had done a lot of research in the school board for many years, they refused to let us do the research because they felt that this uh, approach that we were uh, examining, which talked about phonics, was uh, not compatible with their policy, which really advocated whole language. And I remember saying to the school administrator, I wish I had that much influ influence over school policy, because usually we do this research and it has no effect whatsoever on policy makers. But in the long run, our research can have an effect. And so if you have interest in the applied area, the, these are audiences that you, you want to think about. Um, so I won't go over this because I've kind of uh, covered this now already, but there are a lot of us. The one thing that's exciting about doing this kind of research is that it does matter, actually. People have lots of questions about these issues. So even if you're a really committed theoretical researchers, a lot of what you may do is going to uh, be of interest to people outside the research community, whether you uh, want it to or not. And I, I, I like to present this email. This was from uh, somebody uh, some time ago, and I particularly like this email. Uh, first of all, because it comes from a father. It's very rare that I get emails from fathers. It's usually mothers or women. Very seldom do you get men. A lot's changing, asking about their children's language development. But this was from my father. And just read through this. This is only about a third of his list that I've included. And of course, this, for a researcher, this last bit is wonderful, because without questions, we couldn't do research. Uh, but he, he, these are questions that parents ask themselves. But these are also issues that educators are, are often concerned about. Uh, we had a lively discussion at lunch about some of these things that despite the fact that we may think that there's no problem raising children bilingually or educating them bilingually, lots of people are worried. Parents are often worried about these kinds of things. So that's, your research can be important. Here's one from a school psychologist. And this is in Montreal where it's hard, to, in the English speaking community, it's hard to find a monolingual child. And yet you still find these concerns. So here's a, here's a school psychologist working in the school system. She's facing a child who is thought to have a specific language impairment, and she's, she doesn't know what to do. I mean, that's, that's a serious problem, because this is somebody who is a gatekeeper for this child, and she doesn't know what to do. And you know she's honest and says that what, I, what everybody around me is saying is that learning another language is putting too much pressure on a child who already has trouble learning a language. All right. And then here's an interesting thing from the LA Times, Los Angeles Times, that's really interesting uh, because the, this was sent to me by from somebody in the US and they sent it to me because the uh, headline is actually quite positive, which is not always the case in the US media. But then read the rest of it and you'll see that again, there's concerns. So they're basically saying it's great when you're bilingual but it's challenging to become bilingual, and there may be reasons to think that the process is really difficult. So that's a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about is, is this difficult, and how do kids actually do it? Is that, anybody want to share any comments about this? Do any of you have, if you had children, do any of you have concerns about raising them bilingually? That's a very common concern. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So why do you do environment and what in India, in fact, 
Right. Well, and, that, and so here we have two different contexts which are, have quite different uh, views. So the U.S., where often there's a lot of concern. I, I think in a lot of English-speaking communities, because English is such a dominant language, I think people who speak English almost think that, well, it's normal to speak English. It's, we don't need these other languages. If we wait long enough, everybody will speak English and we don't have to worry about it. But they also, also problematize bilingualism in ways that you don't find in other communities. Uh, but it also illustrates why it's important when you're reading research about uh, children learning language, or if you're doing this, that you pay careful attention to the context in which they're doing that. Because there may be differences, uh, and I'll show some of those differences to you uh, in the results you get. And some of those differences may be related to the con two contextual factors. And, and what's interesting is to ask is, how does the social context influence the way schools or parents interact with children? And, and how does that affect their language development? So it's highly variable. These attitudes are not necessarily the, the main way people think about it. It varies a lot. And certainly the, this group here is, uh, has, has probably more open views about this than other groups. But that's, that's, it is a concern among other people. So what I want to do is I want to, uh, I want to start you with a little bit of history. I guess it shows my age. I always think history, I agree with Jubin. It's important to know what happened in the early stages of, these kinds of, of this kind of research. So I'm going to look at um, research that had looked at code mixing, and you'll understand why. Then I'm going to re uh, review research on uh, that's attempted to <clears throat> look at the process of language acquisition in uh, bilingual children. Uh, some of this is some of the best research on this has actually been done in Spain and some of it at this university. So I'm a little bit uh, anxious about getting it right. If you're studying this topic here and you see any mistakes I made in presenting this, keep it to yourself and tell me later. Because um, <laughs> there's a lot of this research. It's not the kind of research I do. I focus on this three to five, two to five year group, and this is really a very young group. You'll see it's rem remarkable. Uh, the research techniques that people have devised to look at very young children. How many of you are working with pre-verbal children? A couple of you, two or three, okay. And it's really quite remarkable. So keep an eye on what I say, but, and tell me if I've got any of it wrong as we, as we go along. And then I want to end off with talking about uh, what the long-term outcomes for language learners are. And this is really an issue of looking at the critical period hypothesis but from the other end of the critical period. You know, most people define the critical period as being around 12, 13, 14 years of age. Uh, there's been very little research that's looked at how early there might be a critical period. And I want to review some really interesting research that's been done in Sweden and some research we've done on internationally adopted children that looks at children who begin to acquire a second language very early, 12 months of age, for example, or three years of age, and looks at their long-term outcomes to see if there's uh, similarities or differences in what they look like in comparison to monolinguals and what those differences mean. Uh, because I think one of the, 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 one of the issues that permeates all of this research, at least in my mind, is what does it mean to be a native speaker? And in so much of the research on language acquisition, whether it's in school settings or preschool settings, the, the gold standard that people use to evaluate language development in children is typically developing monolingual children. And that raises a whole lot of questions that we really need to answer because then when you start to look at second language learners or bilinguals, you, you're starting to make comparisons that may not be fair, okay, or may be inappropriate, and, they ne and they're probably not very informative with respect to theoretical issues. But we'll come, we'll come to that at the end. And also, this is research that we've done 
uh, using neural imaging techniques. So, and it's very interesting research, and I wanted to share that with you. Okay, so this is a starting point for this round of, of, of my talk. This is a, a, one of the very first studies. How many of you have heard of Werner Leopold? Wow, that thing, yes. You should have, if you're, if you're studying bilingualism and bilingual acquisition. This is the second study, as far as I know, that ever looked at bilingual children, and you can see it was done in 1949, a long time ago, and he actually worked in the US, he was German, and he studied his two children, who were learning English from his wife and German from him, or vice versa, I forget how it went. Does anybody remember? It was, that, it was German and English in any case. And he did what is arguably the most extensive single case study that anybody's ever done. It, it, it was written up in nine volumes. Um, I didn't read all nine, I read a summary of it. And this is one of the things that he says, and I just want you to read that. Hildegard was his daughter. Because it's relevant to the research I'm gonna describe. Okay, so he, what he, he's seeing in his daughter in the very, very first stages of her acquisition of German and English, which was occurring from birth in the home. This is a very common situation. How many of you have children now who are, you're raising bilingually? And in that situation, is the spouse speaks one language and you speak the other one? Yeah, is that the case with all of you? Okay, that's very common. It's not the only situation. You may have a, au pairs or childcare facilities services which are in another language, but this is a very common situation. And what he noticed was that he claimed that when she spoke, she, she really used words from either language whenever she spoke, and it was, she did this rather indiscriminately, and the reason she did this was because, in fact, she, there was only one language from a neurocognitive point of view. So if, in his point of view, in her mind, there was a language, a hybrid language, made up of English and German, so when she spoke, English or German words came out, and it was only later that two speech, what he calls two speech systems emerged. Here's another quote that was widely influential at the time, and basically they're saying the same thing, that in the first stage the child has one lexical system, uh, which includes words from both languages, uh, and, and it in, the implication is that there's no uh, gram grammatical system, and that only in the second stage the child has two different lexicons or vocabularies, and but applies the same syntactic rules to both languages. Does everybody know that, what morphosyntax means? Who does not know it? Because I'm going to use these terms a lot. It's just a fancy word for referring to grammar, and the syntax is the word order of grammar, and uh, morphology is. Uh, the little pieces of language that ties everything together, word endings, uh, functional words, and so on. Okay. So if you don't understand any of this as I go along, please raise your hand, because if you don't understand, other people may not. So in the, it was only in the third stage, uh, they argued, that the child uh, speaks two languages with separated lexicons and separated uh, grammatical systems. So you see this theme, and if you looked at more contemporary research, you would see the same notion, that children were uh, learning a unified system, and the evidence for that was that they were code mixing. And this business of code mixing is very interesting uh, because lots of people who are not bilingual uh, think that code mixing is a bad thing to do. Uh, educators are, who are, and this probably is not very common here because I would suspect that, do most Catalan speakers also speak Spanish? No. Oh, okay. See, in Quebec, a lot of French speakers would not speak English. But a lot of times monolinguals think that mixing languages uh, is a bad thing and that it, it, it implicates that you have, you're making mistakes, okay? So it's as a bad thing, it's not seen as something that's normal or good. And there's two kinds of code mixing. One is this kind where you're uh, mixing within an utterance and one is where you mix between utterances. So in this case, I'm not going to talk about these in any detail, but uh, the the ch mother is showing the child a picture book and asking the child, what's this? And the child says, cheval, which is French for horse. And then, and then the mother says, what's that one? And the child says, doggy. So this is a case of um, mixing, okay? Not within an utterance, but between utterances. It's these cases that are interesting because these are the ones that are, cause, are most cause for concern. 
because pe people, even researchers, used to think that you shouldn't do this. English words should occur in English sentences. French words should occur in French sentences. So there was a lot of research, actually, that used uh, code mixing as an example of uh, this unified stage of development. But there are a number of problems. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into some of this methodological stuff because you're graduate students and you need to know some of these things. But off, you find in the early research on bilingualism that uh, the methodology is often quite, can be quite weak because people don't define their bilinguals very well. They don't have a good conceptualization of what language they're studying and so on. So it's really important when you read this stuff uh, when you do your own research, that you really pay careful attention to what you're doing. Now, one of the problems was that a lot of the early evidence, like uh, Voltaire and Teschner, and the one from Werner, these were case studies. And while case studies have a very, very, very important role to play in language acquisition research, and I'm going to show you some case studies, you have to be careful about generalizing from a case study to a whole population or you have to be careful to generalize about a whole linguistic system. Um, they also, when you go through these reports, they will often give you examples of the child code mixing um, or code switching. It's often called code switching in the adult literature. The child acquisition research tends to use the word mixing just to try to be more neutral. Um, but they tend to look at some examples of code mixing and they haven't looked at the non-mix. How often does a child not mix? Because if a child only mixes once or twice during an hour conversation with an adult, what's that telling you? Quite different from if the child is mixing all the time. <clears throat> they also didn't look at the, the real context for the mixing in any depth, so they often did not look at whether they were mixing into the dominant language or mixing into the non-dominant language. Um, and, they, and in a related vein, they, they didn't look at the general context. So that was a starting point for some research that I did, and I, I probably won't get through all of these studies, but I'm going to discuss a, a couple of studies I did on code mixing <clears throat> early on. This is not recent research, but really, uh, I think, uh, started uh, other research to, uh, that disputed this argument that these kids are confused. So I want to give you just the context, because I said context is important. <coughs> These are kids who are learning French and English at home. This is not the best combination to look at, nor is Spanish and Catalan for the, because these are very similar languages. You might not think French and English are very similar, but they really are. There are very few differences in word order between English and French. There's a lot of cognitive vocabulary. The morphosyntactic rules differ a bit, but not nearly as much as other language pairs. But that's the pair we had to work with. We're looking at children in the one and two word stage of development. Um, how many of you don't know what one word stage means or two word stage? Everybody knows that. Okay. One word. When children acquire language, at least children who learn languages like English and Spanish, when they start to talk, they usually produce a single word at a time. And then they start to produce two words at a time and then they go on to produce more complex utterances. So people in the field refer to this as the one word stage. They progress to the two word stage and then they start to produce more complex utterances. In other words, children don't start off producing multi-word sentences. They go through the simple, the simple trajectory. Uh, as I said already, this, the context is very particular. So we're looking at a community where both English and French are widely used and uh, highly valued. French is actually the dominant language in Quebec. 85% of the population speaks French. Many of Francophones don't speak English. 15% uh, of the community is either English speaking or what we call allophones, speak another language. So it's a minority language in Quebec, but it's obviously a majority language in the country. So. Um, I'm going to, uh, this, all, when I go through this research, one of the things that I want you to keep in mind is that this research on these very early stages of development uh, and the way this research has been done uh, are really done in order to look at children's capacity for dual language learning. Uh, and they're not intended to tell you what, what, what is a typical pattern for children in this community or for children who are raised generally. Okay. And this will become a bit clearer as I go on. But the argument here is that, look, if you think that children 
who are raised bilingually are confused initially, and they mix their languages because they're actually neurocognitively mixed up, then if you do uh, research, even with single case studies, that sh shows that that's not what these children are doing, that is, is telling you, well, if these children are able to separate their two languages at this stage, then it, in principle, any child could. But it's not saying that all children do the same thing. Do you see the point I'm making? So you have to be really mindful of the fact that this is not research that's attempting to, be, to describe typical patterns in all children, because the patterns that uh, typic children might typically show would require larger samples, and it would also require that you take context into account more carefully. All right? So as we go through this, I'll try and remind you of that. So uh, the very first study we did, just to give you an idea how we did this, this is very simple, it's embarrassingly simple, but it had, the, the research that had been done at that time didn't do that. We used, uh, this research, this is the first time I should say, yeah, this was the first time I'd ever worked with such young children. I'd always worked with school-aged children. I was quite terrified, actually, because with very young children, uh, you can't control very much. They just do what they're going to do. So what we did, these children were in the um, one and two word stage of development. So they were, you know, between 12 months of age, actually more like uh, nine months of age and a bit older. And you, what we did is we simply uh, observed them with their parents in the home playing with toys that they would normally play with. And the reason we did that is we wanted it to be as familiar to them as possible and we wanted them to be as verbal as possible. So we, we didn't feel we could do anything that was too unnatural or too experimental. Now what we did, which was really very simple, but which really had not been done, is we systematically looked at these children using their languages with the mother on one occasion. And in all, it just turned out that in this particular study, all, all of the mothers spoke English. And in another occasion, uh, all the, uh, they spoke with their father, and all of the fathers spoke French. So that makes it easy to describe the results. It's not that way in all families in Quebec, but that just by chance was what happened in this case. And, then, and the idea behind this was, if these children really uh, uh, have a fused linguistic or unified linguistic system, then the distribution of English words and French words should be random, and it should be equally random whether they're speaking with their mother and with their father. Now, these were uh, contexts where the mother most often used French English and the father most often used French. Now, parents, this is what's called the one parent, one language rule. Most bilingual parents know this rule. And most parents, I would hesitate to guess, think that it's important to use this rule so the child isn't confused. How many, so how, those of you who are raising your children bilingual, do you follow this rule? No, you don't. Did you did? Yes. But one, the very often one fails. Yes. And it's almost impossible to keep, to keep adhere to it 100%. How, who else is raising children by normal? What do you do? Well, my wife speaks Japanese and I speak English. And you don't speak Japanese? No, no, no. Anglophone fathers of Japanese wives very seldom speak Japanese. Right. So, um, so that was one of the concerns that we have is uh, how do we ensure that our child maintains both languages? Right, and that's enough. Before she, before she went to school, right. she was very much, uh, she spoke a lot of English. But right. After she went to school, she shifted more towards Japanese. And she goes to school in Japanese? Yeah, oh, yeah okay. Okay, that's the other reason for doing this. But a lot of time parents do this because they think that, that the idea behind this is that if the mother speaks one language and the father speaks the other language, then it'll be clear to the child that they're learning two languages and it'll be clear that this is one language and this is the other one. The fear is that if both parents use both languages, the child won't be able to separate the two languages. And that's a re nobody's really looked at this entirely carefully, but that's an interesting issue. Uh, but there's a lot of evidence to think that children have no trouble detecting that there's two languages even though you may be mixing them. Anyway, we, so that's why we did it. Is that clear? So what we simply did is we recorded the kids for about 20, 25 minutes, 30 minutes. We then, uh, we were in the room videotaping. We didn't inter interact with the kids. We then took the audio tapes and the videotapes 
we transcribed them. We did. We transcribed about, if I remember correctly, about five to ten minutes of these videotapes. How long do you think it would take to transcribe five to ten minutes of an interview? Four hours. How many? Four hours? <laughs> ten or eleven at least. Because these kids are very hard to understand. <laughs> Parents think they understand, but as a researcher, you don't. That's very, very time consuming. And then because we wanted to really see how well these, whether these kids were really confused, we decided we're going to look at them uh, when they're with the mother and father together. Because if they're, really using, if they're really confused, then having the mother and father in the same room should really confuse them, right? Because everything's mixed up at that point. So is that more or less good? Very straightforward, nothing very sophisticated, technologically great, because it was very simple. Okay. And there's the rationale. So here's the data. We have six uh, children. Uh, so this is, a, this is better than a case study, but this is hardly the sample sizes that you heard about this morning. These are very modest sample sizes, but it was an improvement over what had already been done because we have six case studies. And this is uh, looking at the children's using English. So as we transcribed it, we tagged as best we could whether the word was an English word a French word or something we didn't understand. Um, so um, this is, uh, these are sort of pseudonyms for the kids. Red is uh, using uh, English, because remember the mothers are all English speaking. So red means using English with the mother and blue means using uh, uh, French with the father. Did I get that right? And you'll see that in every case, but Jean, that the children are using more English with the mother than with the father, okay? Uh, which is hard to reconcile with the notion that they're confused because the mother's language, habitual language with the child is English and they're using more English with her than they are with the father. This is interesting for a number of reasons. First of all, you, you, when you do this kind of research with young children, you always want to be sensitive to individual differences because there are huge individual differences. This kid, Jean, used English and French equally with, with the, the mother and father, used English equally with the mother and father. And it's, this child is interesting because he was probably the most proficient, given his age, most proficient of all of the children we looked at. So if confusion is a sign of immaturity in the language, he, wasn't in, he was the most advanced, admittedly not very advanced because he's pretty young. But also, his parents, from what we could tell, uh, were uh, the family that code mixed the most within the family. So it was a form of communication in this family which was more prevalent than in the other families. And the point, going back to a point that Juman made, is that you know, in looking at exposure and things like that, it's really, really important, if you can, to look at exposure. So not only how much time the kids spend with each language, but who's using which language. But it's very hard to do because we could have done that during these sessions, but that doesn't necessarily mean that this is what the parents do when they're with the kids alone without the experimenters sitting there. But if you can do that kind of research, it's really important to try and do it because then you can correlate the patterns that children use in the family with um, what you're seeing in the lab. And is, is there any relationship? So there's no evidence here that this child is confused. Here is the use of French alone. Remember, French is the father's language. Again, in every case, you see uh, the child is using more uh, French with the father than with the mother. Uh, some cases, very little French, in fact, even though that is the uh, father's native language um, or dominant language. And again, Jean is, um, doesn't care too much. Here's the, uh, when the, this is the most stringent test of it. Here's the kids' use of English when the parents are together playing with the child. Again, there's more uh, uh, English, which is red, or the mother's language, with the parents, even in Jean's case. And there's more use of French with the father, uh, the, the English than French. And then when we look at French, there's more French with the father in every case. So interestingly, when the parents are together, Jean is actually differentiating more than when they were separate. Right? So it's hard to reconcile those results with the notion that these kids have uh, a single system at this stage of development. We then, just to look at this a little bit in more depth, I, I sort of had got this idea, well, gee, this is interesting, huh? 
how much control do these kids actually have over their language? Because um, one of the things that is of concern uh, about children uh, raised bilingually is do they really, are they really communicatively competent or are they compromised? Um, and if you're really bilingually competent, then you, you are able to adjust your language use with people that you're just meeting. You know, any form of community competence means that you're, you're competent using the language with anybody, basically. It doesn't mean that you can communicate competently with people you've been living with for a year or two. That's not really competence, because maybe what you've done with your parents is you've just learned by rote to use this language with the mother and that language with the father. So what we wanted to do is look at how children would use uh, language with people they didn't know. And we wanted to see whether they, were, whether they were sensitive to the language that was being used with them. Uh, and therefore, whether the, the, the input that this, this stranger gave them would influence the way the children themselves used each language. Because another, another thing about communal competence is you tend to adjust your language use to the people you're speaking with. And by looking at whether they were sensitive to the input, it would tell us that, it reinforce our notion that the code mixing that they're engaged in is not driven by internal competence issues, but is driven by more social and external kinds of factors, okay? So again, this, the children are two and a half years of age, so they're well into the two-word and multi-word stage of development. These stages of development, by the way, overlap. It's not like on Tuesday it's one word and then Wednesday it's two or three words and then it, they overlap a lot. Uh, so these children are predominantly you can use more than two words in a single utterance. Um, the, the children uh, met with these uh, uh, people. They were strangers. They were con they were confederates of ours. They were people we trained to interact with these children. They had never met these people before, so they had no experience with them. And they, so whatever language they were using with this adult, whom they had never met, had nothing to do with their past experience. It was really a, it was really a reflection of their perception of the situation at the time and their ability to deal with that situation. Now, we had, uh, we trained the speakers to uh, use the, uh, the child's weaker language um, initially um, because we wanted to force the situation uh, where the child was compelled to use their weaker language because you might expect, and this is what research shows, is that if children are using their weak lang language, they're prone to use the other language because they know it more. So we thought, well, by having them interact with somebody who's using the weaker language, we're testing the limits of their ability to control that tendency, okay? And they met with this stranger on three occasions, on three separate days. In the first day, this, the stranger code mixed 15% of the time. So the stranger, say, let's the weak, say the weaker language is French, say that's the father's language and therefore the child's weaker. These children are usually stronger in the, lang the mother's language because despite all these liberal minded fathers, mothers still do most of the caregiving and children tend to be stronger in the language that they're hearing the most, naturally. So they're using, the, the strangers are using the child's weaker language 15% uh, of the time. But otherwise is using, I'm sorry, is using the stronger language 15% of the time. But otherwise is using the child's weaker language 85% of the time. And then on the second occasion, the child uh, is hearing the stranger use the uh, uh, stronger language 35% of the time. So the, the point here is not the particular percentages. The, the point here is that the child is hearing somebody using more or less of the other language. And we wanted to see whether the children would adjust and change their code mixing accordingly. All right? And then we did a third uh, experiment where they shifted back down again because we were surprised at the results. Okay. We did this, by the way. Uh, you know, typically in these situations, the, the child is there on the, on the rug in the living room with the experimenter or the parent, and we have somebody sitting in the corner video recording the interaction. And the video recorder in this case was trained to count 
how often the stranger used each language. And in this case, for example, every now and then the, now and then the, strain, the video recorder would indicate to the stranger interlocutor to increase or decrease their code mixing so that we could hit this 50% target. This is very hard. If you tried to do this on your own, it's very hard to control your own code mixing to reach a percentage. So the experimenters guiding the, the, inter, the conversational partner of the child to reach this target. Is that fair? So it's, a, it's kind of a semi-experimental procedure. Right? So here's the results. Um, th this is, uh, again, we have more than one child. There's, what, three, six children again, different children. This is the high rate of mix, low rate by the interlocutor, the high rate by the interlocutor, and the going back to the low rate. So you can see that in every case, the, uh, except for this case, that on the first occasion there's code mixing that's very little, and then on the second occasion when the, the blue line, when the stranger enhances her code mixing, the child also enhances it. So in every case that happens. So the, the child is actually responding in accordance, it's code mixing in accordance with the rate of mixing of the stranger. Right? The reason we, did, we went back to a low condition again is we thought, well, maybe what's happening here is that on the first occasion, the stranger is really unfamiliar to the child. On the second occasion, the stranger is more familiar, and therefore they're just code mixing more because it's easier for the children to code mix because when they code mix, they're, able, they're using their stronger language. So we thought, well, let's test this by exposing the, to the child to the stranger again, but this time, the, the stranger lowers the rates of code mixing and we're forcing the child to lower his or and see if they can do it. And they did. Again, except with the exception of this one child. So you always have to be sensitive to individual variation and this tells you, kids are, you know, these young kids respond in different ways. But again, what we're seeing is that there's a very, uh, there's very sensitive fine tuning of what these kids are doing. This is when you combine all of the children, okay? Um, what's this? I'm not sure what the difference is. I've forgotten. Um, now, we had a very, well, I had a very, uh, I was very enthused about these results when we got them, and I was thinking, gee, this is interesting. How are the kids, how are the kids doing this? This is rather complex. So they kind of got a mental calculator where they're, uh, they're keeping track of the, the adults rates of code mixing, and they're somehow or other calibrating their rates of code mixing accordingly. But it turned out to be much more uh, um, uh, mundane than that, because when we did a detailed analysis of what the kids were doing, what we found was that they would be using their weaker language, let's say it's English, the adults using English most of the time, and then the minute, the, whenever the adult used the other language, the turn immediately after that, the child used the other language. So the reason why their rates of code mixing were very similar to the rates that the experimenters were using is because they were tracking, but on a case on a turn by turn basis, what the adult was doing. And if the ch and if the adult used the other language, in a sense, that said to the child, "Oh, it's okay now to use your other language," and that's what they did. It's very pragmatic, but it works because that's the nature of social interaction. Right? Yes. Oh, right, these, um, we didn't look at that, but I have another study I could show you that actually looks at repair strategies. And I probably won't have time to get into it, but um, the kids are, very, I, uh, the kids are very sensitive. If there's a breakdown in communication, so the, and if the breakdown in communication, I mean, there's lots of breakdowns in communication between children this age and adults. I mean, if you've ever talked to a, a two-year-old, a two-and-a-half-year-old, there's lots of reasons why you can't understand what they're saying. They either uh, mumble, they mispronounce a word, they use the wrong word, they're off topic. But in this case, bilingual kids can create a breakdown in communication because they use a language that the other person doesn't know. I mean, bilingual, it's interesting when you look at it. For most children, 
who are being uh, raised in a monolingual environment, the adult is more competent than the child. So if there's ever breakdowns in communication, the adult can repair the breakdown or knows how to repair the breakdown. Bilingual children are in the interesting situation that if they're talking to a monolingual, the monolingual is less competent than they are. Right? So we did a study where we looked at children's ability to repair breakdowns in communication when they used the wrong language. With them. And they were. They were if, the, if they said something to the interlocutor in the wrong language and the interlocutor said what, didn't say, say that in the other language, just said what, they switched to the other language. Again, these are two and a half year old children. So uh, all of these studies taken together really indicate how competent these children are. Even, so there's, again, there's no evidence for this theory of um, code mixing is a reflection of incompetence. Uh, so then the question is why do they code mix? And the obvious reason, the obvious reason is that they code mix because they don't know the words in the language that they're using. I mean, all of you probably figured this out. But again, nobody had really looked at that. So here's a study with the initial group of children. And we simply looked at how often they uh, code mixed when they use their weaker language. Most bilingual kids are stronger in one language than the other. And as I said, it's usually related to uh, the amount of exposure to that language. So here's the six kids, five kids, who used, uh, and we looked at whether they uh, were uh, code mixing from one utterance to the other as a function of whether they were using their dominant or non-dominant language. And what you can see is that all of the children, except these two, three of the five children are using their, uh, they're doing more code mixing when they're using their non-dominant language. So they're talking away in, say, French, and they come across a word that they don't know in French, but they know it in English, so they use it in English. It makes sense. It's a, it's a, it, you know, monolingual kill, children uh, have a phenomenon of overgeneralization. So monolingual children, if they're talking about something, there's a famous example of the, the mother out walking her baby, and the postman goes by, and the postman sticks his head in the buggy and says, oh, cute baby, and the baby says, daddy, <laughs> right? And the mother's very embarrassed because this is not the daddy. The daddy's at work. We, and the, the point here is that the child doesn't have, is, re, is wanting to refer to the postman, but the only word he really knows that refers to an adult male is daddy, and that's the word he uses. So it's a form of overgeneralization. Well, in a sense, what kids are doing here is a little bit like that. It's a strategy for filling in gaps in your lexicon when you have to talk about something and you don't know the word. And these bilingual kids have the advantage that they can use the word from the other language. And in most cases it works because in their, in their families and in many cases in their community, the people around them know both languages and so they'll understand what's being said. Again, individual differences. So uh, this fellow Gene uh, didn't show that pattern. But as I mentioned before, he was actually equally competent in both languages. So it was not an issue for him. William, we don't know what's going on here. <laughs> yes? Um, that's true uh, that kids ask to reach because they don't know the words. One would claim that if you look at normal kids, uh, either they would stop or overgeneralize, or they do have the words. They don't need to switch, right? Because they do have the words. Right. But furthermore, they couldn't switch because they don't know the exactly. language. So does this imply that the vocabulary of these kids is smaller than the vocabulary? In the case of the bilinguals. Often that's the case. At least most of the research shows that if you look at bilingual, older bilingual children and you look at their vocabulary in each language separately and you compare them to age-matched peers, Often, the, the bilingual kids um, have smaller vocabularies in each language. That is correct, the word of the parent, because of the kid is mixing. It's just a part, right? It's not that the kid is confused or, right. uh, or is a uh, 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 schizophrenic or a brother that he doesn't have to. But that's the problem for the parents. Yes. So, uh, 
but may, not, let me turn this around and see if I'm saying that, that, that the challenge here is not really the ch uh, so much a challenge for the child, but it is for the parents, because they have to create an environment which makes sure that the child learns all of the words that they need to know. And if that, therefore, by having the parent use each language, mother French, father English, you have a better chance that the child will get exposed to all of the words that are relevant to their environment. Is that? Yeah, right. I mean, the difference is very low of certain words. Well, that's why when you look at these kids, you, uh, you have to be careful that you're looking at the environment in which they're growing up. Because if they're, I'll, I'll give, give you a bit of this later on, but if they're growing up in an environment where the distribution, in, in terms of how much of each language they're hearing, is balanced, then it's reasonable to think that their vocabulary in each language is going to be pretty comparable. Whether it's the same as a monolingual children is, is another question. But if they're getting a much more exposure from the mother than the father, then their knowledge of French, uh, the mother's vocabulary language in that vocab language is going to be much higher than that of the father. That makes sense. But uh, from the uh, point of view of you have a bias in the parents, so if they are concerned about the reason, in a way, they are, they are right with being concerned. Not yeah. just what they think, but rather the concern explanation. But yes, they are concerned. Well, it depends on whether you think that their parents are justified because of the confusion issue, or the parents are justified in, in terms of the size of the vocabulary issue. These kids are not confused. They just don't know the words in both languages. Yeah. So in that sense, that's right. I think the one parent, one language rule makes a lot of sense. But it's good for the parents because it gives them a way of structuring the environment so that the children do get good exposure to both languages. Is that? Uh, roughly half of the only is getting. Well, that's right. Now, at this stage of development, kids' uh, vocabularies are very limited because their, their lives are very limited. Uh, it, it becomes even a more acute issue as the kids get older because then their environments get much more complex. But then what happens is we're getting sort of a little bit away from these data. But you know, you should, we shouldn't expect that bilingual kids are going to have the same vocabulary in both languages. And can you think why? Social pressure. Right. So if you're, they don't necessarily, you shouldn't expect them to have the same vocabularies because their, their world in this, the home language is quite different from their world in the school language or their friend's language. So they're only learning the words they need. The, and so, they, so there may be an imbalance in their vocabulary because their world is more complex than that of a monolingual child. But as uh, Jubin pointed out, if you look at the children's uh, combined vocabulary, in other words, you give them credit for every word they know, for every concept, regardless of what language it's in. It's called conceptual vocabulary. You find that they are on, on par with monolingual children, and in some cases better, because they know uh, the names of some objects in both languages. So that's important. The fact that they have an unequal distribution in the two languages is, is at this stage due to limited memory problems but also due to the fact that their world in each language is subdivided. They might, even with the mother and the father in the home, the, what the mother talks about with the child and what the father talks about the child are not going to be the same thing. So they might know certain things about the home from the mother that differ from what they know from the father. But does that mean that the gender of the children would also have the right. The question is, does gender maybe have an impact? I, we've kind of looked at that informally. I've never, we've never found, in other words, w w is the mother going to influence the daughter more than the son and vice versa? We've never seen that. The mother has an impact on both children because the mother spends most time with the child and also mothers are more child-centered than fathers. I mean, there's, that's quite a bit of research on this, that mothers are more li likely to talk about things that the children want to talk about. <laughs> Sound familiar? But the father is more likely to talk about things that the father wants to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there's more research to be done on that. Here's another 
Here's another uh, study that looked at why do they code mix. We just looked at two kids, again, Again, this is about what can happen, not what does happen. And we wanted to look at, um, uh, bilingual kids often have translation equivalents. So they know the names of an object in both languages. So they know that this is bottled in English and bouté in French, okay? Uh, so we wanted to see if they had uh, uh, more translation equivalents, um, uh, how much they code mixed, whether they had the translation equivalent or not. So the argument is they're going to code mix when they don't have a translation equivalent. So we did a diary study with parents where the parents recorded what the kids were saying, the language that they said it in, and every time they code mix, they were asked, did the child know this word in the other language? And what you see is that for Wayne, 90% of the time that he code mixed, he had no translation equivalent for that word as far as we could tell. For uh, Phoenix, these were very young children. I haven't got the ages here, but they were, you know, they were really in the one word, early two word stage. So they're, they're really around 12 months of age, more or less. Uh, he code mixed about 65% of the time when he didn't have the translation equivalents. Now what's important, I mean, this is all very simple <coughs> stuff and probably uh, stuff that you, especially if you've got bilingual children, you, you've seen. But what's important about this when you put it all together is that uh, by looking at this phenomenon more carefully, the results are, are indicating competence, not incompetence. Remember we started off with this, uh, this unitary language system hypothesis where people were saying that this code mixing is really a sign of incompetence insofar as they did not have separate systems. Well, this research is saying not only do they have separate systems, and I'll show you other evidence of this at an even earlier stage, but they have a lot of control over the way they use these languages. So the code mixing is actually a sign of competence, not incompetence, because it isn't random. And they can control it to quite a degree. I won't get into this. This is a really interesting study, but I've kind of given you the results on this. OK. OK. So, from, so this is, I, I'm going to just jump to the next section, but this is research that really uh, was, fairly, was fairly prevalent early on it, when people started to look at uh, uh, bilingual acquisition. And this is in like the 1990s. And then, and it really sort of uh, dealt with this issue of whether people think that there is a single system or not. And it basically says uh, they don't. They, have, they seem to have these two systems. And it's, it's evident at least as early as the time when children start to produce single words. So any comments or questions on And again, this doesn't, uh, this, what the, you have to interpret this very carefully. This really speaks to the issue of uh, children's, uh, what children can do. Children can keep their languages separate if the environment indicates that there are separate languages. There are lots of communities where the language that is commonly spoken is a hybrid of two languages. So if you look at those children, you're not going to necessarily see that there's evidence of separate language systems. All right? But in this community, and in most communities where there's separate languages, that's what kids are exposed to, and they know this. They don't know it in a conscious sense, but they know it intuitively, and that, that's indicated by these kinds of results. Is that, is that okay? Okay. Now, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna step back and look at research. This is not research that I've really done. Uh, this is research that has taken off from this early research, and it's been looking at more at the, pro, more at the, at the early stages of dual language acquisition, and it's kind of trying to look at the process of early language acquisition beginning in the pre-verbal stages of development, looking at language development even before kids are verbally competent. All the research I talked about up until now is really restricted to kids who can actually use language, whereas some of this research is, looked at, is looking at children who are pre-verbal. And it's the, same, it's the same sort of issues as why do, you, why do you do this? Well, there are lots of practical reasons, but the theoretical ones are right, quite compelling. Um, and a lot of the research here has really been designed to, to ask the question, how do children actually do this? How is it that they can acquire two languages 
um, at the same time that a lot of children are only acquiring one, do they go through the same developmental stages uh, as monolingual children? Again, the, 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 the framework here is always with respect to monolinguals, and I want to raise that issue in a moment. Uh, but do they go through the same milestones? Do they go through these milestones at more or less the same age of, of uh, develop, age of development? Or do they, are they slowed down by this process? You know, it used to be that a lot of the really early research on bilingualism and some of the kind of cognitive research that Juven was referring to, the cognitive stuff, some of this was done in the 60s and 70s. Uh, Wally Lambert and Paul Kohler is in this group. A lot of the thinking at, at that time was based on the very simple hypothesis that learning two languages is either a good thing or a bad thing. And it was good because, it was bad because learning two things is twice as hard as learning one. That makes sense. It's harder to do th two things in one. But there was also the other point of view that learning two things is good for you because of, you exercise your muscles. But that's, uh, that's as simple as the theorizing was to a large extent. It was a little bit more complicated, but, but not much more. But the whole field has moved into a stage of development of its own where the questions are, mu are getting much more sophisticated and much more theory driven. So the questions here are, well, if they're able to do what I've shown you they can do in these conversational studies, how do they actually do that? How do they acquire two grammatical systems? How do they acquire uh, two lexical systems. Do they do it at the, in the same, uh, 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 at the same ages? Because that would mean that they can do the same thing in half the time that monolinguals need to do it. Okay? Uh, what are the similarities in processes that underlie dual language development versus monolingual development? Are there differences? And what are those uh, differences related to? All right? um, and fundamentally, there's the question is, uh, do models of monolingual acquisition apply to dual language learners? And if they don't, maybe we need to change our models of monolingual acquisition if we have any pretense to developing a theory of language acquisition in general. And ultimately, it seems to me, it raises the question that I mentioned before, is what does it mean to be a competent language user? So we always use, you know, where we say, well, the child is good at, it speaks like a native speaker. And we invariably mean like a monolingual native speaker. Because these children are native speakers. Right? They don't, in the Canadian census form now, when you're asked to give your native language, you're allowed to enter more than one language. I don't know whether that's true here, but it should be. Because there are a lot of people who do not have one native language. But we still really implicitly, if not explicitly, use monolinguals as the frame of reference to determine what a native speaker is. And it seems to me, as all of this research, and especially the neurocognitive stuff as it moves forward, really calls for us to really broaden our conceptualization of what it is we're studying and how we categorize these phenomena. Any comments? Or? OK. So I'm, I'm going to break this up into kind of two segments before I get into the one on the very last one. And I'm going to look at what I would call foundational steps. Uh, this is where I'm sort of on shaky ground because this is not my research. This is research that's being done by other people. Um, but I'm going to look at two domains of development uh, that, have, uh, re that have been done with these children. One is looking at la language discrimination and speech perception. And the other is looking at early word learning and vocabulary development. Now, the reason I call these foundational is that uh, you have to put your sort of head in the head of a of a five-day-old child. And so you're wanting to learn language. And you're a dual language learner, so you have to learn two languages. And the question is, is, how do you break into those two languages? This is true for monolinguals. When you acquire one language, and you're, bo you're born, even before you're born, and you hear all this noise around you, how do you figure out what's noise and what's language? And how do you then start to break the language up into bits and pieces which you can then combine into words and grammatical sentences, right? So it, it's like listening to a foreign language for us. How do you deal with this incredibly complex uh, acoustic system, okay? In the case of these children, it's the very same challenge, but in a sense, it's much harder because they're getting two sets of noise, linguistic noise, and they have to sort them out, all right? 
So a lot of this research, in my opinion, is really looking at these foundational steps. And again, what it doesn't do, it's important to understand what it doesn't do as well as what it does do, it doesn't uh, necessarily tell you, despite what I, how I described this presentation, what it doesn't do, it doesn't necessarily talk about the influences on these children's language development. I thought I was going to do that and then I realized there was just too much work here. What it's really looking at is children's capacity to sort out this very, very rich linguistic input that they're getting as soon as they're born. Okay. It seems to me, uh, it's interesting, I was, on a, I was recently on a panel for a thing called the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine in the United States. So this is a federally funded organization which uh, is commissioned on occasion to do a review of research on a specific topic. This is something that's been going on in medicine for a long time where, and I think this happens in other countries, they want a, a panel of experts to sit down and sort out the research on treatment for breast cancer or treatment for prostate cancer or treatment for toothache because they want to make decisions and policies that are evidence-based, but the evidence is overwhelmingly <laughs> complex. So they get a bunch of people together and they say, look, would you work for us for two years and we won't pay you and we'll give you a lot of work to do, but this is what we want you to do. And people, for some reason or other, I still don't understand, agree to do this. It was one of the most horrible experiences of my life. But I learned a lot, but it was a lot of work. And we were asked to do one on how to improve the uh, educational success of English learners. In the US, uh, kids who come to school and don't speak English are referred to English learners. They're really uh, children who are Spanish speaking for the most part. I, and the term here would be English, le not English learners, obviously. Immigrants? No, no, no. Uh, we call them newcomers. Newcomers, OK. A more neutral term. Yes. Newcomers. Sometimes they're referred to English as an additional language. Sometimes in the English-speaking world, there's lots of terms. I was on this panel, and I was working with the preschool age group. And even though preschool is not relevant, directly relevant to educational issues per se, uh, when you think of it, looking at these children in the preschool years is critical to looking at their subsequent development in or out of school, right? And in the case of dual language learners, kind of a neutral term, it's critical that we look at this research in order to understand their capacity, their ability to learn two languages, and, and, and whether or not they do or not may not be their fault. It may be due to the circumstances that they're growing up in. So I was on that subgroup. Is that clear? So we looked at a lot of this research of these children from about zero to three. We looked at the research that was looking at these foundational steps. All right. And then uh, that leads into research that l looks at kids' morphosyntactic development, which, because once you've got these foundational steps under your control, then you start to build more complex grammar. And this will become a bit clearer as I uh, go forward. So, uh, you know, one of the things uh, that emerged from all this is, is that when you look at this research, no matter where it's done, a lot of it's been done here, a lot of it's been done in Canada, a lot of it's been done in uh, the US. Uh, the point of comparison is invariably monolinguals. Um, and I don't know about here, but in, in, in Canada and the US, this is a very controversial issue because people think that it's unfair to compare dual language learners with monolinguals because they're different. Um, I don't know, what's your view on this? Is this an issue here? Mm. It's a big issue for us because there are a lot, well, you have a lot of immigrant kids too, but you know, you have cities in Canada like, like Toronto where 60% of the kids in school do not speak English when they come to school, or Vancouver. That, yeah, about this, another problem I find is that people also assume that monolinguals will have a greater ability to learn language than dual Right. That's a good point. I mean, using, so using the monolingual as a frame of reference is problematic for that reason, 
that who are these monolinguals? There's more and more research on variation in monolingual children. Not as much as you might imagine, actually, but I think that's going to happen more and more. But what about comparing these immigrant kids, let's say immigrant kids for the sake of argument, although a lot of these kids will not be immigrants as such because they may have been born here, but they speak Berber or they speak Turkish because they're in a community in, in Barcelona where that's the dominant language. In, in, in Canada, they, these kids can grow up speaking Arabic because in their immediate family and community, that's the only language they hear. So they're not immigrants, but then we also have a huge immigrant population as you do, and the kids are, their parents have immigrated and they speak only that language. And we invariably, when they get, when we're seeing them in the preschool years, or certainly at the school years, we're comparing their performance in the majority language with monolinguals. Right. Yes? That's not fair. I think that's the question you want to answer. So if you have to answer whether the development is the same as a monolingual, you have to go to the Right. What else? Yes. You want just to know how they develop themselves, but you don't need to compare to anyone. What is the point? So what you said, what the point? You ask the question, is, do you think that's fair? Or do you answer the question? Right? Yes. That's what I, that that's how I would answer. Did you want to comment on this? Uh, yeah, because uh, well, what I thought is that as long as there are some norms um, for like monolingual children, I mean, when we want to make sure that um, there is no um, delay or some language impairment and so on, we know how to check that for monolingual children. But we do not have norms for bilinguals, um, and I mean, as far as we know that. Uh, Development is different, not only like in terms of you know like the, the stage of development, but possibly um, in a qualitative way. Mm -hmm. I think that as long as you don't have the bilingual understanding. Right. Yes. I'll come back to that. Yes. But I think there's a great difference, especially in preschool, because kids here, for example, they come to school and they have a Catalan mother or a Catalan father. They can give a speech. Well, quite often teachers think they're intelligent because they, they have a verbal outcome. Compared to others, maybe they are, they are shy. But even maybe in their context, they're not shy. But in the Catalan context, they're shy. The and immigrant kids or the uh, uh, I mean, even Catalan? Yeah, it's like there's a very different, I think, um, reception. Even what they tell the parents, they say, yeah, he's very intelligent, or she's a... Doing well or whatever, and it's so much related to language. And yes. it's also a great difference if they come from Spanish, because if they come from Spanish, it's much easier to switch to Catalan than if they come from another language. But I'm not sure what you're, are you saying that this is a fair comparison or an unfair? No, I mean, they, they compare it always to monolinguals or to monolingual, often, even, even if they're not conscious about it. Mm -hmm. But is I know they would but like should, to but but should But should we be doing that? But let me just say one thing. I mean, the case of Catalan, just as the case of Basque, is very special because we don't actually have Catalan yeah. monolinguals. Yeah. Right. Everyone speaks. That's right. That's <laughs> true. It's very, I mean, right. no, one, no one finds that. Let's move on. No, now. that's true. To our knowledge. So when we have immigrant kids coming to schools, just like in class country, and we observe how they acquire Catalan, we compare them with other. Catalan bilinguals. There are no Basque monolinguals. There are no uh, Catalan right. monolinguals. It's interesting, and then it becomes That's an issue. It's interesting because it becomes an issue. But is it really the same as comparing? Sure. Yeah, no, that's I hadn't thought of that. That's true. Uh, but is it really? Country. But is it really the same as say taking somebody to Canada, say Montreal, yeah. who's from a Arab-speaking community? Because it's true in the English-speaking community in Montreal. All, everybody, the kids all now speak French and English. When we do research on monolingual English kids, you can't do it in Montreal because they all speak French. Not like native speakers, but they, so, but is that the same as, uh, so comparing them to English speakers in that context, I'm not sure it's the same as comparing them to Catalan speakers too, because both languages are official here. Uh, they, they get a lot of, sure. right? But it's interesting because- Yeah, no, it is. Yes. This is a non-issue. Right, right. That's right. But I, but, I, but I agree with Albert. The fundamental issue to me, because I had to fight over this. People didn't want this. It, 
didn't want these studies being described in terms of how monolinguals were doing because they thought that's really supporting this monolingual bias. And I think at a theoretical level, that's true. I think that there's a, there is a, it's a, it's a bit of a dead end, I think, at this point in our in research to take the monolingual as the primary source of comparison. But I also think that it's useful to do it to the extent that you're asking, well, is the process the same? Because we know a lot about monolingual acquisition, and it would be interesting to know uh, if bilinguals can do the same thing as monolinguals in the same way, because then that, that's very informative. Right? And if there are differences, and this is really the crux of the issue, the problem is if these uh, immigrant kids are performing different from the monolinguals, then that difference is usually interpreted as a deficit. They, yeah, it's bad. They're not, the vocabulary is smaller than the monolinguals. They're, they don't have the same grammatical complexity as monolinguals. And that's always, almost invariably, I shouldn't say always, often interpreted as something that's negative. But let's take, but maybe what you're, what, right. But what if you take the vocabulary example? So say you find that these kids have a smaller vocabulary in English than monolingual kids. Why should they have the same vocabulary in English? Right? Because their world is different. And the language they're, they're using. Well, in each language it might be smaller, but together it's actually larger. Yeah, then we ask how they speak in English, but how right. smaller. Right. But that is, then, then, do you inter then it's a matter of how you interpret that. Is that because they're, they don't have the competence to do it, or because the environment that they're living in? Probably because the environment. Right. Probably, probably but often people, yes. right, but people don't often take that next step. That's the problem. They say there's a deficit in their vocabulary, or they're not doing as well in something else, therefore there's a problem. Rather than saying the child needs more enrichment because this is important for them in both languages. I agree with you that if these children are in a monolingual or a Catalan Spanish bilingual environment, they need to be able to measure up. But it's a matter of how you interpret those differences, it seems to me. I also think theoretically, it's even less important to compare them to monolinguals at one level, because if they're truly different, then why would we expect them to look like monolinguals all the time? Mm -hmm. No? Yeah. I mean, we have to allow, at least theoretically, for the possibility that kids who learn two languages from birth are actually different, yeah. and that those differences are not necessarily bad. I think in the real world, it's often the case that it's not useful, but in a theoretical way, don't we have to open up to the I possibility mean, that this we... This morning we saw it. we are different. Right. That the body was not different. And I'll show you some brain, data at the brain. end, right, yeah. Anyway, I'm just going to throw that out there, I, because the, some, of these, uh, some of this evidence has caused me to really reflect a lot on, okay, what do we do with this research? How do we interpret this? Because more and more there's differences emerging, and therefore the question is, especially when you do research, how many of you are kind of oriented towards more applied as opposed to academic research? Or Not sure yet? Better start thinking about it. You guys, okay. I mean, when you work in applied settings, educational settings, clinical settings, then this is a challenge. Because you, you, you don't want to be in a situation where you think you're saying things about these children which are actually pejorative or negative or, you know, that are unfair. I don't have any answers myself, but when you tell parents, oh, gee, their vocabulary is lower in English than that, everybody says, oh, gee, we're going to stop using Polish at home because that's why they're not doing as well in English. They would probably have smaller vocabularies in English even if only English was being used. Who knows? Anyway, I just want to throw that out there because it seems to me, in terms of the meta picture, the field of language acquisition is now starting to turn a, maybe turn a corner where our notion of what it is that we're studying is changing. And you can decide. Okay. So, I'm going to start off by looking at language uh, discrimination speech perception. And I'll, I sort of, what I'm going to do is show you, and this is really a, kind of a fast and simple overview of this research. 
And uh, there's probably a lot of questions that could be raised about uh, what this really means or where to go from here. So my interpretation may be a little bit overly general, but I think it's fair enough given the state of the research. But if you disagree, let me know. So, uh, as I said, one of the challenges for children learning language, I'm talking about monolingual children, is how to sort out language from all of the other noise that they're hearing. Because you can imagine when children are born, it's really noisy out there, right? And they're hearing language, they're hearing uh, cars, they're hearing the TV, they're hearing the radio, they're hearing all sorts of stuff. So, in order to learn language, they really need to be able to sort out the signal from the noise, as it were, all right? And research with monolingual children, we've known this for some time, shows that newborn monolingual children show a pre within, really within a days or hours of being born. If you give them the option of listening to different languages and looking at which language they orient towards, they prefer to listen to the mother's language and the mother's voice over another woman or another language. Are you all familiar with this research? It's quite compelling. So there's this attentional bias that children bring to learning language within hours of being born. Um, Sorry, Fred. You are kind of cold. Oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe it's from Canada. We think 19 is. <laughs> it's about 19. <laughs> also, I'm generating a lot of energy up here, so I'm getting hot. Um, and also, uh, Jacques, this is Jacques Mailer's research, uh, shows that monolingual neonates, they can discriminate. It, so they've been born, they're really young. You give them uh, two unfamiliar languages. Uh, and you do whatever you need to do to see what, can they discriminate between these two languages or does it all just sound like one big language? And the research shows that they can discriminate between unfamiliar languages uh, which belong to different rhythmic classes. Languages have different rhythmic structures uh, and there's a limited number of structures. There's two very common ones, three very common ones. And if they're, un and the, and if they're distinct, if they belong to different rhythmic classes, uh, neonates can discriminate between these languages quite early in life. So this is from a very general perspective, this indicates that uh, even before they're born, in the womb, children are processing language in a very, very sophisticated way. So they become, in the first case of the first study, they're becoming familiar with the rhythmic structure of the language the mother is using, because they prefer the mother's language over the father using the same language. Presumably because in the womb, they're getting feedback about the mother's breathing, the mother's body movements, and so on. And infants like familiar things, so when you give them that choice when they're born, they show a preference for the mother's language, and they show that they can discriminate between unfamiliar languages. So this is really, really important because it focuses their attention on the acoustic information that tells them what, how the language that they're going to learn is structured, okay? So the question is, what about uh, re, uh, bilingual learners? Because they've been exposed, and this is the case of children who are raised from the very beginning in two languages, do they show the same biases? Do they show the same tendency? Because if they do, then this is really useful because it means that as soon as they're born, these children, uh, and potentially all children then, have the capacity to attend to what's important in their environment when it comes to constructing this new language. So this is a group of researchers. There's two really big groups of researchers in this field. Uh, some of them are here in Barcelona, and the other group is Janet Worker's lab in Un University of British Columbia. There are others, Patricia Kuhl, Jock Mailers, uh, to some extent. Anyway, you're going to hear a lot about these, this group as well. So they were looking at, uh, they looked at English, and I'm going to always get kind of tell you what these participants looked like, because it's important to know these things in this research. So these kids were young, birth to five days of age. These are really young children. They were either English monolingual speakers. This was in Vancouver. English is the dominant language, but lots of uh, other languages. And the other kids spoke either, uh, spoke Tagalog and English, uh, or they were learning Tagalog and English, okay? Um, and these two languages have different stress patterns, which we don't have to get into. Uh, rhythmic classes, one stress times and one is syllable time, uh, so they belong to different 
rhythmic classes. So they're good to look at from that perspective. Uh, I'll also describe some of these t techniques to you because some of the, because I don't work with these, some of these were interesting to me, but also you may find them interesting. And it shows you how sophisticated some of this research has become, even with children this young. So they recorded sentences um, it, that were, were spoken in either English or Tagalog. Tagalog? 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 Tagalog. Okay? Good. I can't, I can't get it wrong. Anyone's acceptable. That's when you're bilingual, you opened all sorts of possibilities. Um, and these, these sentences were matched for things like pitch, duration, and the number of syllables, and they were low-pass filtered just to preserve the rhythmicity. They wanted to preserve only the acoustic information which, uh, which primarily distinguished these languages, but also this is information that uh, in, uh, prenatal pre infants would actually hear. Fetuses actually hear this information in utero. And they, and they played them, uh, the, each of these sentence types, uh, for as long as, and this was a non-nutritive sucking response, so the children, while they're listening to these uh, sounds, are sucking on a nipple that is attached to a, a device that measures the rate and the uh, pressure of their sucking. And this is really an indication of their attention because when children, and this happens fairly quickly with young children, infants, their sucking rate decreases and the pressure decreases. So they're familiarized with these stimuli until they, uh, um, as long as they maintain an 80% rate of sucking, okay? And when it falls below that, then they go into the test phase. So they become familiarized uh, with the language, these sentences, and then you want to see whether they detect a shift in the language. So uh, in the test phase, they hear alternating um, uh, samples of language uh, between English and Tagalog. So for, uh, in this 10 minute period, they would alternate between sentences in English and in Tagalog. And they determine how, uh, uh, how much they actually responded to each of the, uh, of the shifts from English to Tagalog and back, okay? So it's a way of looking at whether the children are detecting the differences between the two languages. Um, and this is one of the early techniques that was devised to look at preverbal infants. So you're looking really at a, a, a level of language learning in children who are not able to actually express what they know about language yet. Let me see if I can interpret these carefully, uh, correctly for you. Here are the results. Um, these are the English monolinguals. So this is their, uh, uh, their preference. So when, if the, this is no preference between English and Tagalog, okay, during the test phase. So in, in the best place to start is with the English monolinguals. So their rate of uh, responding is uh, primarily when they hear the English stimuli. So there's a lot of kids in this range. This is their their rate of responding to the English stimuli during the test phase. In the case of the, uh, the Tagalog bilingual children, they're, um, they're showing, no, they're, this, this is, doesn't look this way to me, but this is what the statistics show. There's no, prefer, there's no differential preference between the English and the Tagalog speech samples. They're showing preference for both. So, they're, so which is kind of what you'd expect given that, that they have been uh, exposed to both English and Tagalog pre prenatally and also for the few days after birth before they were tested. Uh, interestingly, the, uh, they had a bilingual Chinese group which also showed no preference. Um, so uh, they are arguing that this, is, this effect is not simply because they were bilingual, um, but it's because they were, they, were, uh, they were exposed to Tagalog and English. Because they're showing this, this split. They're not showing a preference for Tagalog and, and English because they're, they haven't been exposed to two of them. Okay? It's a control group. But the important point here is that the monolinguals show a preference for the language that they've heard, and the bilinguals show, in a sense, a preference for the two languages that they've been exposed to. Okay? So this is important because uh, this shows the same kind of biases that you find in monolingual children, and it's a bias that really gets 
a leg up on the language acquisition process. Um, so they showed this uh, language, uh, there's, a, there's a follow up study um, that showed that kids can discriminate between these languages uh, as well as monolingual children. So it wasn't that they weren't showing a bias between Tagalog and English because they couldn't discriminate, it's because they were showing this bias for both of them because they uh, had been exposed to both of them, okay? Okay. And also, if you look at neonates, uh, these kids, they can distinguish between rhythmically similar languages at the same time as, uh, as monolingual children. This is when monolingual children do it, all right? So the value of this is that um, at this point, we're not seeing differences between these bilingual kids and the monolingual children, at, at least in this simple paradigm. They're showing the some preference to the two languages that are in their environment and that are important to learn. And they also show this, I didn't go into that study, but they show the ability to discriminate between uh, rhythmically uh, similar languages at the same age as monolinguals. So the fact that they have this more challenging input environment hasn't actually altered these fundamental uh, processes. Now, um, Uh, so that's, that's a couple of ways, simple foundational ways in which these dual language learners are similar to monolinguals. But when you read this literature, what you also see is that while that some of the, the fundamentals are the same, there are also differences between these kids. So this goes kind of back to our earlier discussion that, that sometimes the differences are interesting and, and they're there. And the issue is how do you interpret the differences? And so I'll give you an example of a difference that emerges. And this was an interesting one. Uh, uh, research, on, again, on monolingual children has shown that uh, monolingual children, very young children, can uh, discriminate languages based on visual cues alone. They don't know that. So they'll show, they'll show kids people speaking in different languages, English or French or whatever, but they mute them. So they can, and then then they they test them to see if they can discriminate between the visual cues. Do they know that somebody speaking English uh, is now speaking French? Do they detect that? They don't know that there's a shift from English to French, but they know that there's a shift in how the mouth is moving. Okay, and monolingual children do this, um, and if, and you must do this in in Barcelona. This is a common bus time activity in Montreal. You're sitting in a bus and you see people and you say, these are interesting people, what are they speaking? And I mean, this happens a lot to me in a bus, I'm sort of thinking, does this look like French? Does this look like English? And it's based simply on the visual cues, okay? So monolingual children do this, and the question is, do bilingual children do this as well, all right? So this is a study that was published, again, in uh, Janet Worker's lab, and they looked at monolingual English children, and they uh, looked at bilingual French English children, and these were children who were fit four, six, and eight months of age. So again, uh, here's the, the procedure. In the familiarization phase, the children are listening to silent video clips of speakers producing a sentence in either English or in French. They don't hear what's being said, but they see the speaker producing English or the uh, hear the speaker producing French, okay? And they, in this case, they're looking at, they're using what's called the head turn preference procedure. They're looking at the kid's visual gaze. So there's a visual, there's the visual in front of the child. You, typically what happens is there's a bullseye that turns and that gets the kid's attention. They're sitting in a chair on the mother's lap. The mother is, in this case, probably blindfolded, but also has headphones on, so they can't influence what the child's doing. They get the child's attention by moving the bullseye, and then they will start with the visual of the person speaking English or French, and they see uh, how long they attend to that uh, stimuli, uh, and they, they, they discontinue the familiarization phase when the child's looking time falls below 60%, okay? And then they do the other language. So they're familiarized with the two languages in that way, and then in the test phase, the child either hear, hears the same speaker speaking the same language or the same speaker speaking a different language. And they, they look at the child's uh, looking in order to see whether they notice the difference. Okay? Here's the results. Monolingual infants 
I always have, it takes me a while to figure out these graphs. Um, so this is the monolingual infants, and this is looking at the monolingual bilingual infants together. And this is rather complicated. What I want you to really focus on is over here, because this is really that brings it all together. During the test phase, the pink data are the children at eight months of age. The blue data are the children at six months of age. So what you see is that what's critical in this is that it, when they're uh, six months of age, both the bilinguals and the monolinguals will, uh, during the test trial, their uh, attention uh, is towards the uh, discrepant trials. They're detecting the difference, all right, when they're young. And monolinguals do this up to a certain point, usually six months of age, and then they stop using the visual cues, presumably because there's enough acoustic information or they just, I don't, I don't think there's been an explanation for this, but monolinguals don't continue to use this visual cue beyond six months of age, probably because they don't need to, because all they ever hear is English. Whereas, uh, and if you look at the eight month data, which is in pink, the bilinguals, who are the dotted pink line, they continue to use the visual cues, and the, and the uh, monolinguals at eight months don't. So what these data are, sh are showing is that the, the bilingual children, in contrast to the monolingual children, use these visual cues beyond the age when the monolinguals discontinue using it. Now, the ar so the argument they propose, which distinguishes them from bilinguals, is that this is an adaptive process for these kids because they're constantly having to distinguish between the languages that they're hearing and visual information uh, in addition to the acoustic information and also presumably the speaker uh, helps them to do that. For the monolinguals, the argument, I guess, is they don't need that information because all they ever hear is English. All right? So I've, I've, I've cast this study in a slightly different way maybe than the experimenters themselves would. But I'm sort of presenting this to you as an example, and there will be others, of how, on the one hand, while we're finding similarities between the bilingual kids and the monolingual kids, there are, are also differences. And most of these differences really speak to the adaptability or the flexibility of the dual language learners in adopting strategies or using strategies that are relevant to the complexities of the situation they're facing. Okay? I mean, in and of itself, uh, it's, you know, it doesn't mean a whole lot, but within the context of the challenge of learning two languages, it, it seems to me that's what it's telling us. Okay, was there a comment over there? No. No, I just had a question out of curiosity. What kind of visual cues did they show? Just the face or also the hands that they No, have? just the face. Okay. So it would be me speaking English okay. on one occasion or me speaking French on another. So they're used to seeing me speaking English, and then in the test trial, they would, they would see me, they're not hearing it, but they're seeing me speaking French by my lip movements. And they, they were attending because it was discrepant from what they had seen before. Okay. Some of this stuff is quite clever, actually. I can say that because I didn't do it. Um, now, this business of, going back one study, of distinguishing uh, these prosodic, uh, these languages on the base of prosody is uh, worth comment commenting on a little bit further. And I won't get into this in detail because it gets rather complex. But uh, as I said, languages have different uh, prosodic structure, rhythmic structures, where there's a strong weak or a weak strong pattern in the, in the, the rhythm of the language. Um, and it turns out that these uh, these um, rhythmic patterns, uh, languages, simply speaking, can be divided into those that have the strong pattern versus a, a, a weak pattern, str strong versus weak and weak versus strong. And that pattern in the rhythm of the language, which is the overall shape of the sound of the language, correlates with, a gr with the grammar of the language. So languages are divided up not only by the rhythmic patterns they exhibit, 
by, but also in terms of the grammatical structure. So there are languages like English where you get there's a, the, the function words of the language, words like to and the and a and e and on. These are, these are words that are, have no referential meaning. You can't point to anything that tells you what the word the means. Whereas the clicker is a content word because you can point to somebody something that's a clicker, right? So uh, in, in general, uh, content words like this tend to get more stress and they tend to be longer uh, in terms of their, uh, their um, du the duration of the signal. And they also are more uh, frequent in the language. Whereas these function words, these sort of grammatical morphine kind of words, they tend to be less frequent in the language, they tend to be low stress, and they tend to be of short duration. And that's not 100% the case, but it's true of many languages. Certainly in English and French, in English and Spanish and French, the content words tend to be multisyllabic, they tend to get stressed, and they tend to be felt relatively frequent. Whereas the other words, these function words, um, have these other characteristics. So what you can see, I hope, is that the, uh, the stress pattern of the language, where you have strong, weak, the, the languages which have a strong weak pattern tend to be languages where the content words precede the function words. So on, does anybody speak a language that's like that? It's, it took me a long time as a young student to figure this out. In English and Spanish and French, the function words precede the content words. So we say to the store, in the box, a box, a store, right? Um, but there are other languages where the function words follow the content words. So the pattern, what, so what, this, what this actually means is that the grammatical pattern of function plus content word maps on to the weak strong pattern of the rhythm of the language. Whereas the pattern strong weak rhythm maps on to the structure of content words and function words. So what, what's important about this is that when kids are learning, there's a lot of things like this in language acquisition that kids will use information at a simple level, the rhythmic information, which they, which they are exposed to in utero. They use that information to try to figure out the grammatical structure of the language. And it's called bootstrapping, because they're using information from one domain of language to bootstrap them into a more complex uh, uh, level of the language. All right. So the reason I mentioned that is, going back to this study, the fact that these children are able to use the rhythmic characteristics of the input language, or languages in the case of dual language learners, is important not only because it tells us they go through this stage of development at the same time as monolingual children, so there's no cost to being bilingual in that sense, but they're also use, they're able to use that information uh, to actually begin to bootstrap into the grammar of the two languages. So if they're learning two languages which have different grammatical, morphosyntactic, syntactic patterns, they're already beginning to learn that when they're learning the rhythmic characteristics of the language. Does that make sense? So it's doubly important in a sense. It shows us not only is the, is, is the timing the same, but in, in reaching this milestone at this level, they're also beginning to work towards the next milestone, which is to figure out how are, the, how, how are, these, how are the words organized in the language. Right? So I, I, there's more detail than I uh, gave there, but that's the general point. I guess we're supposed to have a break, is that right? Yeah. Okay, so we'll come back to this business of foundational things after we have a coffee. So, any comments or questions? Okay, so, yes. Yeah, um, you said that uh, monolingual children prefer the sounds of the first language compared to the sound of other languages in Korea. Um, but what if, for example, a foreigner uh, produces uh, a sound like, if I speak English, it's quite clear that I'm not that my mother tongue? Do you think that children can recognize that the rhythm is 
<clears throat> so the question is, oops, is somebody up there controlling this? Albert, okay. Um, the question is, uh, this business of children uh, preferring to listen to the mother's language over a um, foreign language. Uh, but also there's been research that's looked at their discrimination. So it's not a matter of preference, but they, do they notice a difference between language A and language B, both of which are unfamiliar. Okay. And both monolingual and bilingual children uh, make that discrimination fairly early on. I think it's around four months of age, if not earlier. And there's no difference in when they do that. Uh, if you give them lang if they're if they're from different rhythmic classes, if they're from the same rhythmic class, like uh, German and Dutch or something, they don't discriminate them at the same time. They, it takes a month or two longer before they can do it. Okay, so it makes sense because if, if what they're really responding to is the overall prosody of the language, then if they have different stress patterns, weak, strong, strong, weak, then that's fairly clear. But it is interesting how, that they can do this very early in development. But if they both have strong, weak, or weak, strong, then it, it takes them longer to pick out the differences. Okay. Any other questions, comments? OK. So here's another. Uh, so we, we, we see now that they, can, they prefer one the, the language that's addressed to them over other languages. We've seen that they can discriminate these languages at the same time as monolinguals. And we've seen that they use visual cues longer than monolinguals to, as an additional, presumably as additional source of information to uh, detect which language is being used. Uh, another major uh, milestone in language development in monolinguals that's been widely studied is their uh, perceptual discrimination. In other words, or phon and phonetic representation. When the best way to understand the challenge for children is to imagine that you're hearing a language that you've never heard. And it all just sounds like garbled. You can't differentiate one sound from the other. You don't know when a, a word starts and when it stops. And therefore, it becomes essentially impossible to learn the language. You know, the notion that children can learn language from TV, it's probably an overstatement. Because if all they hear is the language and, there's, and they don't associate any of that language with meaningful input, it's probably virtually impossible for the children really to learn language from TV if it's just continuous speech. Because they can't pick out the individual sounds of the language. So it, what's been widely documented in the case of monolingual children is that between about uh, birth and uh, six to eight months of age, uh, uh, children can discriminate uh, many uh, contrasts in the language, many phonetic contrasts in the language, regardless of their language experiences. So let me give you an example. In uh, <clears throat> English, the sound R and L are, di are, they are different sounds. They have different acoustic properties. And they're also linguistically important because if you substitute the two sounds in a, in a common frame, it changes the meaning. So rot and lot are different words, and those two sounds have what's called a phonemic difference. Okay? Does every, do I need to explain this? Does everybody know the difference between phonemic and phonemic? Everybody know what a phonemic difference is? Okay. Um, so what happens is when ch kids are born, up to about six to eight months of age, they distinguish th these kinds of contrasts uh, for a wide uh, set of sounds, regardless of their specific language experiences. And then around six to eight months of age, and certainly by the end of the first year of life, they can discriminate uh, the sounds that are phonemic in their native language, the input language, but they have difficulty or cannot discriminate sounds that are no longer phonemic. Does that make sense? So Japanese children can distinguish R from L up until six or eight months of age, but after eight months of age, if you give them that contrast, they don't discriminate the difference because in Japanese, changing R and L sounds don't make a difference. Okay, <clears throat> so th this in itself is very interesting from a dual language learning point of view because what it means is that when children are born, 
they're born with the capacity to distinguish a lot of the acoustic differences or contrasts, phonetic contrasts, in, la in any language. So there's, no, so there's no limitation on their language ability due to that discriminability ability. Does that make sense? Um, but the question arises is, uh, what happens uh, with respect to this, what's called perceptual attunement, that occurs between six and eight months of uh, age, do dual language learners show the same trajectory in this uh, development? So there's been some uh, research done, and this is 2008 by Burns and Alec, again a group from Janet Worker's group, and this is the contrast between ba and pa. So um, I won't get into this in detail, but the dis difference between the ba sound and the pa sound is a matter of when the, the voice onset time, the difference between the, the, uh, when the vocal folds open and the release of the air. And I won't get into it, but <coughs> if you're a French speaker, if, the, if there's a delay in this uh, release uh, uh, that occurs around here on this continuum, <laughs> then you no longer hear ba, but you now hear pa. In English, uh, the, you, 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 the distin distinction between ba and pa occurs here. All right? So there's this range of sounds, of, of sounds that are ambiguous with respect to whether they're a French pa or an English ba. All right? So, um, and, and, and this is a function of the VOT. So the question is, when do children learn this distinction? And because it's different in English and French, the question is, if you have English-French children, do they show the same uh, pattern of distinction for this as monolingual children? You might think that it would be different. You can't, uh, again, on the simple logic that this is a more complex problem space for them. They're getting two sets of sounds, and maybe it's going to take longer for them to sort it out. And this is really important because they, they have to begin to form a, 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 an inventory, a repertoire of what are the sounds that are important for learning, learning the words of English. Because these sounds are important in learning individual words in these two languages. And it's important for sounding like a native speaker. Um, so this was a study that was done with monolingual English speaking children and with bilingual French English children. Again, here's, uh, these are kids who are uh, 6 to 8 months of age, 10 to 12 months of age, and 14 to 20 months of age. And this is uh, 6 to 8 months of age is the age around when it's still a universal uh, ability that children have that's independent of language experience. And then here, these two ages, when it is actually becomes more uh, language specific. And what this is really telling us is this is, we're now seeing the influence of language experience on these kids' perceptual abilities. Um, so the technique here is that they, they hear in the, in the familiarization phase, <coughs> excuse me, they hear this, uh, the sound that occurs at this point along the VOT continuum. So it's ambiguous as to whether it's a, a French uh, pa or an English ba, okay? So uh, for the, for the English-speaking children, uh, in other words, this is not clearly one or the other. Or, or for the English-speaking children, this is going to be hear, heard as a, a, a ba as opposed to a pa. For the bilingual kids, it could be hear, heard as either one, depending upon whether they think it's English or French. Now the bottom line in all this is when they, I'm going to cut, to cut to the quick on this because this is a rather complex, but the, uh, the bottom line on this is that in this phase of six to eight months of age, when it's a kind of um, universal pattern, the bilinguals and the English kids and the bilingual children uh, are, are showing the same pattern. So they, they, they're dis... I'm sorry if this is going to get confusing. They dis, they, when they hear this sound as a test, when they hear this, they hear it as a ba, but when they hear this, they don't hear it as a pa. So the French boundary is sufficient for both groups to distinguish between these two sounds as different phonemes. The argument is that this is a salient, for some reason or other, they don't know why, this is a salient difference in VOT, and that both groups can hear it, whether they're bilingual or monolingual. 
So it's, it's really the, the, the universal stage of their development. Um, when, they, when you get into the 10 to 12 months of age, uh, the question is what kind, of, what kind of pattern do they show? And they're, dis they're, uh, they're showing recovery to both uh, the, the, the ba pa sound and the ba sound. The, the, the bottom line here is that the, the bilingual kids are showing the same attunement pattern as the monolingual kids. So despite the fact that they're hearing uh, two sets of input with two different VOT times for this discrimination, the bilingual kids are able to do it just in the same way at both ages as the, as the monolingual kids. So it's not slowing them down. So that their ability to, uh, to create these uh, phonemic uh, inventories is basically the same for the two groups, okay? Now, that, it's not necessarily the case when you, for all contrasts. So this is a, a study that was done here, and it's looking at uh, the distinction between uh, uh, Catalan sounds. So this is a contrast between the two sounds that are um, phonemically different in Catalan, but not in Spanish, because the Spanish sound falls in the middle and it incorporates those two. If you present bilingual kids with this uh, contrast, what you find is that they actually uh, fail to make this discrimination as early as the monolingual kids, uh, and it takes them a, a month or two longer to make this discrimination. And that's arguably because the Spanish sound that they're learning incorporates this distinction and it takes them longer to separate them. So the point, the reason why I present this study is that, um, that there are differences here. So if you've got contrast, phonemic contrasts in the language which are phonetically fairly straightforward, then bilingual children are able to do this at more or less the same age as the monolingual children. However, if they're learning two languages, such as Spanish and Catalan, where there are contrasts which are ambiguous. So they, it's a contrast that's important in one language but not in the other language. Then it may take them longer to sort it out because it is ambiguous. Um, so what's important about this is that, there are, again, there are differences between the bilinguals and the monolinguals. But in this particular case, the difference doesn't reflect a sort of lack of capacity on their part per se but it reflects some of the, the complexities of learning two languages which may have, in this case, acoustic properties that are ambiguous in the two languages. All right? So, because I, 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 I want to be careful in uh, emphasizing that uh, dual language acquisition may be very similar in some respects as monolingual acquisition, but there's also respects in which it's different. And, and it's a matter of how you interpret these differences that is important. So, it, so in this case, the interpretation is <clears throat> that this is a hard contrast to make because it's important in one language and not in the other. And it takes them longer to recognize when it's important in the other language. So I won't go into that because it's okay. Okay, I'm just going to skip all of that. So this is just a case where they, they need more time to learn this stuff. Okay, so up to this point, we've seen that the kids show this bias to, to listen to certain languages. They show the ability to discriminate various languages. They started to uh, create these uh, ph uh, phonemic inventories in their two languages, and there's important ways in which they're the same. So the next stage in language development is to start to learn individual words, because it's not enough just to learn what the, the, what the rhythm of the language is and what the sounds are that make up the language you want to start putting those sounds together to create words. Now, in saying that this is the next stage, I don't mean to imply that language acquisition is a simple process of discrimination, uh, phonetic dis representation, and word learning, and then grammar. These things often are co-occurring, but their progress is emerging earlier in some cases than in others. So, the, as I've mentioned a couple times now, one of the challenges in learning a language is how to not only form, decide what this, the sounds of the language are, but what constitutes a word in that language. So this is a study that again was done here <coughs> that is looking at children's ability to segment words from continuous speech. 
And this is a very difficult process because there's no clear boundaries in continuous speech between when a word begins and when that word ends. So when children are hearing the input languages, they're really hearing continuous speech, which really means is that there's no, there's no clear, it's like beads on a string, and you don't know where, the, where a bead indicates the beginning and end, and end of the word. Okay? You have to figure that out using other properties of the input. So this was a study that was done fairly recently, six and eight month old Spanish Catalan bilinguals and monolingual infants of each language. So in the, in the familiarization phase, the children are given sentences with the pseudo words in either Spanish or Catalan. So, so these, this is continuous speech, um, but embedded in this is words that they've never heard before. Um, and in the test phase, they simply wanted to see, did the, did the bilingual, were the bilingual children able to <coughs> recognize in the test phase the pseudo words that had been presented in continuous speech during the familiarization phase? Um, because that would give us indication that they're able to segment words from continuous speech uh, in the same way as monolingual children, and that they were all able to do it at six months of age. So again, they were better at eight months of age, but they were all able to do it at six months. So again, it's really rather dramatic that these milestones are emerging at pretty much the same uh, time, even though these kids are getting much more uh, input, uh, complex input, at least in, in the two languages. <coughs> So looking at word learning is also about um, uh, learning the meanings of words, not just how to produce words, but you have to know what the, sound, the words mean. And one way in which it's thought that children uh, learn words, this is a big topic of much discussion and research, is that you associate the meanings of new words with new objects in the environment. So in an experimental paradigm, if you give children the new words to learn, they're likely to associate those new words with objects that they've never heard before. And this is just called associative learning, <coughs> excuse me, because you associate the new word with a new object. It's a simple matter of association. There's other theories of word learning, but this is one. So in this study, which is called the, the, the switch task, again, it's by the group from Vancouver, um, they, they use what's called the switch task. There's a habituation phase where they hear two pseudo words, lif and neem. So these are words that differ from one another with respect to every sound in the word, the initial, the, the medial, and the final sounds. Uh, and th these words are associated with novel objects. So, a, so one might be associated with this kind of thing, and the uh, other word might be associated with another object. <clears throat> so there's an association between the new word and a novel object. Um, in, the, in the test phase, they're either, they're either presented with the same trials, where the novel word is associated with the same novel object as during the test phase, or they're presented with a switch trial, where they're presented with an object uh, which has the other object's name. So you're switching labels for objects. <clears throat> and that's different from what they heard during the test phase. Um, so and the, the logic of these studies is if they <clears throat> look longer at the switch trials versus the same trials, then it's indicating that they've learned the association. Precisely what the, the, the challenge in a lot of this research is knowing exactly how to interpret these results. But at a minimum, what you can say is that if there's deferential looking towards one condition as opposed to the other condition, then minimally you can say that they've detected a difference between the familiarization phase and the test phase. <clears throat> now, the, 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 the hypothesis that they were testing out here is that bilinguals might be slower at this task because they, uh, they, must, they have to learn more words and more sounds. So there's more associations to learn. And given that we know that the vocabulary size in each language is smaller, maybe that's indicating that they're just not as good as this. Um, on the other hand, it could be that they're equally good as monolinguals because overall their conceptual vocabulary is the same. 
So overall, the vocabulary learning is just as extensive as that of monolinguals, in which case you might not expect a difference. But if it's really their experience in each language that matters, you might expect them to be inferior. And what the results showed is that neither group showed learning at 12 months. They weren't able to expect this difference at 12 months, but both groups showed it at 14 months. Again, no difference. Right? So th these research, these studies are interesting, especially if you're <clears throat> a graduate student and you're trying to do publications. It's generally hard to publish null, effect, null results. So one of the controversies that uh, Juman was referring to in this cognitive advantage field is that the, the research was coming out of Bialystok's lab and other labs that was reporting this cognitive advantage. Um, and the people, there are a lot of people doing similar research who could not find these advantages. And when they would submit it for publication, they were arguing that there was not a bilingual bias, there was a publication bias, and that, uh, that for some reason or other, the journals were only favoring the studies that got the positive effects. Um, I don't know why they, but the problem is in all research that's true. It's very hard to publish the results of your research if you get null effects because there's a lot of reasons why you might get no difference between one group or another. It could be you did a bad study or you selected the stimuli or something went wrong. But this is, I mentioned this, this is relevant to you as students is that uh, null effects are interesting if they tell you something. So if you expect that there might be a difference, so in this case you expect the bilinguals might do less well, um, and you don't get that difference, then it's important and you can get it published. So if you're doing something where you think that there might be null effects, you have to have a good argument for thinking why you might get an effect, so that the null effects are informative. <clears throat> Now, I'm just going to uh, extend this study. So we see that they can do this as associative learning paradigm as, as well as monolinguals. But it's not true in all cases. So the, the study I just talked to you about used uh, pairs of words that had multiple points of difference. But in, in, in this other study by uh, Chris Fennell and his colleagues, they looked at uh, the ability to form associations between novel words and objects using minimal pairs. Does anybody know what a minimal pair is? These are words that differ in only one sound. So be and de. Everything's different except the initial sound. Whereas the other one, it varied in all three sounds. <clears throat> and in this study, again, there's uh, bilinguals and there's monolinguals, and they tested them at 14, 17, and 20 months of age. And what's important here is that the, monoli the monolinguals were able to associate these novel words with novel objects um, at 17 months of age, but uh, the bilinguals were not. There's no difference here. So, but by, eight, by 20 months of age, the bilinguals were able to do this. So again, there are differences. Where the, where the learning conditions are more complex uh, and where there's not enough information, in a sense, then it may take bilinguals longer to do it. So again, there's this interesting contrast between what's similar and what's different. Uh, <clears throat> now, there's an interesting uh, sequel to this story, and that is that on the one hand, the argument could be that this is a more complex task and the bilinguals need more time to do it because it's complex. Uh, it could be that it takes them longer because they have reduced exposure in each language. But there's another explanation. And this was uh, motivated the study by Fennel, Byers, Heinlein, and another group, uh, where they argued that maybe the testing conditions were not appropriate. That the stimuli that the, the stimuli that were presented to both groups of learners were produced by monolinguals. But the language input that bilinguals get is often produced by bilinguals. And so the kind of, uh, if you like, phonetic landscape that bilingual children are getting is not the same as what monolingual children get. So bilingual children might be hearing uh, novel sounds from people who are bilingual, uh, but they may also be hearing uh, novel sounds from people in a language that they're not totally proficient in. So when they go to produce the English words, and if they're francophone, then they may not sound the same way as they would if they were produced by a 
an anglophone. Um, so that the, the input is more variable, and therefore it takes them longer to stabilize the sounds uh, that, that are phonemic in their language. So they did an interesting study where they, they used the same paradigm as before. They gave them this associative learning task. And, but this time, instead of presenting them stimulus, uh, stimuli that were produced by monolinguals, they gave them stimuli that were produced by French-English bilinguals. And you see, some of these sounds might, might be phonemically different in the two languages, even though to our ear they sound the same, but they may have different voice onset time distinctions in them. And what they found was <clears throat> uh, that bilinguals could do this at 17 months of age if they were using stimuli spoken by, the bi by bilinguals. And the monolinguals could not do it at 17 months of age when they listened to the stimuli produced by the bilinguals. So that's really interesting. I mean, it, 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 it indicates that uh, when you're doing this kind of testing with kids, you have to be very sensitive to the kinds of uh, environment in which these kids are learning the phenomenon that you're studying because the input that they're getting or the exposure that they're having is not simply the sum of two monolingual inputs. There actually is a, dis a difference in the input that they're getting and it's actually, in a sense, a testimonial to how sensitive they are to the linguistic landscape or the acoustic landscape because it's the difference between being able to do it and not being able to do it. And what's interesting here is that this study was uh, replicated by another group in another lab. So it's always important that this stuff get replicated. Now, one final piece here, and then I'll move on to the final set. And um, again, this is a, an area that shows that bilinguals uh, are adaptive and really creative in the kinds of strategies that they use to acquire the language. Um, and so, there, does everybody know what this phenomenon of, of mutual exclusivity is? Who does not know what this is? Okay, I'll just do a very simple thing that most of you know. So, mutual exclusivity is postulated to be a strategy that monolinguals use to acquire the meanings of new words. And it runs basically that if you hear an unfamiliar word, you associate it with an object or a concept for which you do not have a label yet. So you don't assign a new name to something that already has a name. So if you know that that's called glass, then when I say there, you're not going to associate that word. Or I, I, I use a pseudo, word, a pseudo sound in English you're not going to give it two names, because it already has a name. <clears throat> and this has been documented in, to occur in uh, monolingual children. When you look at bilingual children, it does not apply as, well, as much. They do it to some extent, but they're more than willing to learn more than one label for the same object, because in, in, when you're bilingual, this is what language is all about, that the same object can have more than one label. I mean, and you wouldn't think anything of this, but monolingual children actually avoid doing this. So it's a way in which bilingual children differ from monolingual children, but it, it, it's evidence that they are adaptive in the kinds of strategies they use in order to deal with the realities of dual language learning. Okay? Okay. So just to sum up, and then I'll move on to the final section. So there's clearly similarities in what goes on with these kids which is really, really important to, to uh, know in, the, in, in a sense, in, in the abstract, in the sense that given the right learning conditions, dual language learners uh, show similarities in some really basically fundamental aspects of language development. So in terms of language discrimination, preference, phonological fine tuning, associative word learning. These are, there's, this is not everything there is to learn, but these are some key ones. But at the same time, there are these differences. Um, and to a large extent, the differences reflect differences in the learning environment, differences in the complexity of learning two different languages, which often have characteristics which are either different or, and in fact, may be ambiguous, uh, and just differences in, in how the two languages work. Okay? So any comments on that? I think that what has not happened in this area of research, which probably needs to be done, is there's been very little research at looking at the factors that influence the, the um, 
factors that influence these developmental patterns. So in contrast to uh, some other areas of language acquisition research, people have not looked at uh, SES very much. They haven't looked at the, long, the language differences very much. They haven't looked at uh, inconsistencies in the language report. So I think there's much more room for looking at a variation in these patterns. And at the moment, my, my perception of this research is that a lot of it, a lot of it has been done in order to uh, address this issue of whether children have the capacity for dual language learning or whether it exceeds their capacity and therefore should be evidence in, in a sense, deviations from this pattern. But so far, the evidence is saying, look, there are many, many similarities and there are certain differences, but these differences don't reflect a lack of capacity. They really reflect adaptability or flexibility. Now, I want to then just really jump ahead and describe two studies, one that we've done and one that was done in Sweden that looks at this business of dual language learning into the future of these learners. <clears throat> and this is, really, um, this is really done in the context of the critical period hypothesis. And I won't go into this detail, but this is all the notion that uh, was promulgated some time ago by this guy in his geese, right, Conrad Lorenz, who noticed that at a certain stage in development, these young geese would imprint on certain objects. In most cases, it's the mother goose. Uh, but they would also print on a moving block of wood if that block of wood was presented to them at a certain critical period in their development. Right? Now, in most cases, the environment of the animals uh, lines up with things that are functional for them. So for these geese, it's functional to imprint on the mother goose because it's the mother that's going to take care of them and keep them out of harm's way and so on. But this is a picture of Conrad Lorenz and these geese have imprinted on him because he was the first moving object that they encountered at this point in their early point in their development. Okay? So <clears throat> this, uh, this business of uh, periods in development when you're particularly sensitive to uh, certain kinds of stimuli is very important because uh, it means that the behaviors that you learn or the cognitive alterations that you go through at that point become hardwired. And that's really important for learning because it means that it's going to be hard to change the, that higher wiring by later experiences. You don't want a system, an, or, or, an organic system like this, uh, to be changing whenever the environment changes. You want it to be adaptable to those changes, but you don't want it to really totally restructure itself. So in the case of language learning, it's useful for kids to become fine-tuned to, to the phonetics contrasts in their native language, because then they can use that inventory of sounds to build words and grammar and so on. You don't want them to be changing that inventory whenever they're incidentally exposed to different sounds or different languages, okay? Now this was a, this was a concept that was applied by uh, Wilder Penfield from the Montreal Neurological Institute uh, it, to the case of first and second language learning. And, and the other fellow, of course, many of you know about is Eric Lennenberg, who argued that language is also subject to these critical period effects. And it was generally thought that these effects occurred around 12, 13, 14, 15 years of age. And the idea was that up until that stage in development, your neurocognitive system is sufficiently plastic that uh, certain kinds of learning experiences will change the structure of your brain, of your, the knowledge that you're encoding in your brain. Um, and then after that period, it's hard, those kinds of, in fact, those kinds of inputs will not change learning in any significant way. Okay? So most people, yeah. Sorry, can I ask a question? Well, that's what I'm going to look at. That's the real question here is, 
can you acquire a second language completely or like a native monolingual speaker to the same extent if it begins after this critical period, such as the person you knew. And I'm going to show you some data from Sweden that suggests that it's hardly ever exactly the same, but it depends on how you look at it. So that's the issue. And then I'll talk about a study that we did with internationally adopted children, which also addresses this issue. So everybody's kind of familiar with that. Now, what people have done in this with this, this is an incredibly complex area of research. From a common sense point of view and from a general empirical point of view, there's no doubt that the older you are when you begin to acquire a second language, the less likely you will achieve a level of performance that is comparable to that of native speakers. I mean, that's pretty well attested. Um, but what, we, but what, what has seldom been looked at is how early these, these critical period or age effects occur. And this research that I'm going to present to you that was done in Sweden in our own research really looks at the lower limits of this and raises, I think, some really interesting questions. And for our purposes, what it does is it raises the question is, can uh, children who learn additional languages that don't occur, when that doesn't occur at the, from birth, can they ever be identical to monolinguals? Yes. Um, that's a surprising question in a way because what you were saying that um, why should a monolingual be like a monolingual? Right. And now you were saying, well, could that say it's right. a year old become a monolingual? Well, who cares? <laughs> I mean, we know that these kind of kids, uh, as she was saying, these kids that are with uh, adults, that they learn the language, how they, how they behave, they develop. Right. Uh, well, I'll, so I want to. We have to agree something there. We have right. to put this in the situation very hard to understand, or some, some sort of viewpoint. But come on. You're saying that I'm contradicting myself. And you're right, in a way. Um, but I think you'll see, I think actually it does matter, despite what I said before, and in response to your earlier comment, it does matter in the lives of many children whether they're different from monolinguals. So, because in the school system, for example, in clinical settings, differences from monolinguals often lead to decisions about what to do with these children. So, uh, so I don't think that those differences are irrelevant. I think they are. What I think is the question is how do we interpret those differences? And what do they mean from a theoretical point of view? So, it, so this is sort of asks ask a question that in some sense is contradicting what I said earlier, but I think it leads to some interesting results which helps us to shed light on language acquisition in general. So that goes back to uh, early Right. So, so competent that if they are not monolinguals, who cares? Well, let's come back to that when you see the data and we'll see whether, do, it's a question then of does making that comparison provide any additional insights? And then we can say, well, then why bother? I mean, in general, I kind of agree with you. I don't care. I mean, I get into this all, a lot of times with parents when they're trying to decide whether to send their kids to a dual language program, a bilingual program of some sort, and they're, they're worried that if they study through the medium of another language, that their English vocabulary is going to suffer a little. And my attitude is, who cares? Because <laughs> in the process, they acquire another language, and that opens up far more doors than having a smaller vocabulary closes. Um, this is this, but, this, but these findings from this research raise a lot of questions in my mind about what to do about these differences, because they're there. And I'm not quite sure what to do with it myself. I'll throw them out and you can tell me what you do. Yes? And uh, things that we always think about continuous bilingual development, what is happening if it is disruptive and you lose your first language. Right. And that, I think that's quite different. So some of the research I'll present deals with that loss of the first language. Yeah. I'd like to 
much to the horror of francophones. Right? <laughs> Well, Con in English, people use the example of Con um, Joseph Conrad, Conrad who's, whose native language was Polish, but then he wrote in uh, English, and he was brilliant, absolutely brilliant, yeah. And, but your point is an important one, depends on what you look at, and one of these studies makes that point. So whether it matters or not, to go back to Albert's point, also depends on, well, what are we looking at? It is. And I also don't speak right. No, it is a very. I mean, in Montreal, it's a, it, and it varies by context. In Montreal, for example, because uh, English and French, even though French is the official language, but because English is so important in a general sense, that you often in the in public domains and on the media, you often have people who say on, in the English media, they speak English as a second language, and it's very clear that it's their second language. They're not the best second language speakers, but people, they don't care. They just listen, you know, it could be a weather report, could be a news report, nobody cares. But in other areas I've been in, if the speakers on the media don't speak flawlessly like a native speaker, they don't believe what the person is saying because they think, gee, if you can't speak English properly, then I don't, I don't believe what you're saying. Or they, they see them in a more negative light. So it, these things do matter, but, it, but in Montreal, everybody at some point has to speak a second language. So we've become very tolerant of what it means to be a second language. In monolingual environments, I think they're often less tolerant because it's not an important issue in their community, or they think it's not important. So this is one. How many people know this study? This is a, one of my favorite studies. Abraham, uh, uh, Abrahamson and uh, Kenneth Hiltonstam at the University of Sweden in Stockholm, or University of Stockholm in Sweden. Um, and this is a, <laughs> that's what happens when you're bilingual, eh? you get confused. Um, so this was quite a complex study, and he really, he really set out to look at the critical period hypothesis in the traditional way by looking at groups of people who had begun to acquire Swedish as a second language at different ages. So he had, and he, but he did some really, really, really interesting methodological things. And that's why I like the study. So he had uh, 195 uh, speakers of Swedish as an L2. Uh, and he went through an extensive screening process to identify these people. So uh, in order to be considered for the study, they ran ads and did all sorts of stuff throughout Stockholm for a long time. And they only identified people initially for initial inclusion if they self-identified as having native-like competence in Swedish. And then they actually uh, subjected them to a variety of tests, including judgments by native speakers of Swedish, and, and said, and they had uh, highly proficient and less proficient L2 speakers, and they said to the judges, is this a native speaker or not, and so on. So they, they only worked with the people who uh, were self-identified and other-identified as very, very proficient in, in Swedish. So right away, we've got people like a number of you were referring to, people who were very, very competent in the second language. Um, the first language of, of this group was Spanish, which is useful to have that control. Um, most of them, on average, were 19 years of age at the time of testing. So they, had, uh, they were not children. Uh, they had lived in Sweden, on average, for 10 plus years. So they had lots of exposure. Uh, and they spoke the Swedish that is characteristic of Stockholm. All right? um, then he broke this group of 195 people into subgroups based on the age of onset. 
So this is also an interesting methodological issue. I don't know if any of you have tried to work with this construct of age of onset, but it's very, it can be very hard to know when people begin to learn a second language, because it just doesn't, one day you wake up and you're starting to learn Swedish or French or whatever. It's often a gradual process and don't know for sure. Anyway, he subdivided them into people who had acquired uh, uh, Swedish as a second language uh, before 12 years of age. Uh, there were 107 in this group and 88 who began to learn Swedish as an L2 after uh, 12 years of age. Um, they, in other respects, were quite comparable to one another. Now, he, what he wanted to do was he wanted to assess their competence in Swedish um, in a number of different ways. So it gets at the question that you raised, well, it may, whether or not you're as good as a native speaker may depend upon how you assess people. And that's really what he set out to do. Um, all 95 of these people had been judged, as I said, by native speakers of Swedish as um, um, having native-like competence. They were judged by 10 native speakers, so this was a very rigorous assessment. Um, I won't get into the other stuff. And then he um, assessed whether they, had, they had, were perceived to have native-like competence. So they were all judged in general to be native-like, but then they gave them this uh, more, uh, more carefully calibrated score of whether they were perceived to be native like from zero to ten. And they were analyzed and those those that subgroup was then looked at in more detail depending upon how old they were, whether they are less than five years in the country. They began to learn the language at less than five years of age, between seven, six and seven, eleven years of age, between twelve and seventeen years of age or older, and then at twenty-four months, uh, twenty-four years of age getting tired, sorry. Um, so here's some general statistics about these. This isn't the most interesting thing, but of the early learners, 62% were perceived as L1 speakers, uh, and 6% were absolutely not. So there was, a, there was a tendency for the younger learners to be perceived as native-like. But of the later learners, and I forget offhand actually how he subdivided that, I'm sorry. Only 6% were perceived as native speakers. And 58% were perceived as L1 by one, one judge or no judge. So there was this clear age continuum, but the younger was generally better than older. Okay? Now here's the data that are most interesting. This, he, he subjected these, these people who were judged to be overall native-like to a very extensive battery of tests. In fact, there were tests, there were 10 tests that they uh, were subjected to, and these were very, very demanding tests of language proficiency in Swedish. They were things like, they did a VOT thing, if you're familiar with VOT, it's looking at whether their voice onset time uh, boundaries in Swedish were the same as native speakers of Swedish. This is a very fine-tuned test. But they were also given tests such as interpreting uh, proverbs, you know, haste makes waste. This is the kind of thing that is, is difficult to pick up as a, as a native speaker. They were also, uh, one of the ones that actually was particularly useful was they were asked to listen and understand Swedish with noise in the background. It's very hard for even proficient native speakers to comprehend the second language in a noisy environment. So the point here was that all of these were uh, tests that were difficult even for native speakers. All right. Whereas in many studies of the critical period hypothesis, the way they assess them is to use tests which many native speakers score perfect on, on the assumption that native speakers should do well on these tests. Therefore, those are the ones we're going to use to test the hypothesis. But we all know that not all native speakers actually do well on everything. So here's the. So what you have here is. The, uh, these are the, uh, the number of subjects. Sorry, this is very complicated. Well, it's quite simple in the final analysis, but he was scrupulous in presenting his data. This is the age at which they had acquired, um, in the second, begun to acquire Swedish. Early childhood from zero to five years of age, late childhood from six to 11 years of age, adolescence, early adulthood, and later adulthood. Okay? And all of these numbers here, these are the bands 
that define these age ranges. All of the, these are numbers of the number of people who scored native-like on seven of the tests, or on six of the tests, or on three of the tests, who had acquired the language in early childhood. Is that, can you get that? It's important that you understand that. It took me a long time to get this. Um, so, um, and then he does that for every age group, all right? So now what you can see clearly, just from the step down, is that the older the age of that onset of acquisition, uh, the fewer the people you have that scored native-like on more than one or two tests, right? Because the further you get out along here, the only people who are scoring native-like are only scoring native-like on zero or one, not zero, but one or two tests, okay? Yeah, it is. Yeah, that's why, if it's not clear, please tell me that. So, so these are, the focus on this group to start. These are all the people who learned Swedish as a second language starting between birth and five years of age, right? Mainly three and five. And this is the number of tests that they scored native-like on. One, two. So the people who, there was one person, there was one person who began learning uh, Swedish as a second language be before he was one year of age and he actually scored there were three of people like that who scored native like on ten of the tests this is troublesome yes you're, prob you're getting ahead of me I think yeah but, but, but let's just look at the overall shape of it to start does everybody get that so as you the older you get the fewer and fewer people there are who have scored native-like on a lot of the tests. And that's kind of what we all believe. So that's not really surprising. He's just presented it in minute detail and also using some very difficult tasks. Yes? I'm sorry, uh, I may have missed it. How is native-likeness measured? By self-rating and then by these native speaker judges. I can't remember. I think he had a combination of those, but I honestly can't remember. In fact, I think he used a scale that I used in another study where they were asked to judge. They were given native speaker samples and these speaker samples, and they were asked to judge them on uh, vocabulary, grammatical competence, comprehensibility, and a whole bunch of stuff. So native-like was that they scored. Did I have that? Well, if they, if they scored uh, like native speakers on, on four out of the five, then they were considered native-like. So there was a cutoff. Not all, not all the native speakers scored at the top level, right? Four out of five in grammar? Four out of five scales. So the scales were grammar, vocabulary, pronunciation, comprehensibility, and fluency maybe. So if you scored... Uh, and the scale, it was complicated. Say the scale was nine points. If you scored eight or nine on four of those, then you were considered native like It was very rigorous. I mean, this is a really... So these are people who, like you were mentioning, for all intents and purposes, they sound like native speakers in Swedish. That's the important thing. These are people who can pass as native speakers just based on what you're hearing, right? And what you can see is even using that very simple measure, very few people who began to learn the second language after 12 years of age scored in that range, if you take five as a cutoff, right? There's a few, but not very many. Whereas most of the kids who learned it, or people who learned it in the early or late childhood, are in the category of six or above. So that's the general, that's our general notion of the critical period. I think. Yes. I mean, some of them, I guess, are just natural by impulse, whereas some other are instructed by impulse, right? Right. So how did they manage to control this part of the Right. Did everybody hear that? That one of the complications at this point is that 
the method or the mode of acquisition and learning would be quite different for these learners compared to these. Hang on to that, because you'll see that that's true, and it should favor the early learners, but you'll see there's, that's what's interesting about it. But yeah. come back to that after I show you the next slide. Yes. Uh, sorry, in advance, uh, it may come up later uh, on your presentation. Uh, the basic argument from the people who do language acquisition and, uh, and in adulthood against the critical period hypothesis will be that uh, the amount of input is never going to be the same. A child uh, right. co co correlates, socializes with other kids and highly, is highly dependent on an adult, be it school or preschool uh, environment, whereas those who come to a foreign country right. to work may be limited to yes sir, goodbye sir. Right. Uh, and that uh, undermines uh, the well, entire Right. Did everybody hear the comment? So that if you're young when you start to learn the language, you've had lots of exposure, whereas the older you get, the less. So I agree, if you start to look at these people, it's not very interesting. But if you look at these groups and these groups, some of these people have been exposed to Swedish for 30 years. There was a wide variation in the age at testing, and even though they might have started late, they were also quite old often. So, but again, hang on to that, because the interesting thing is in how poorly the young learners did. So I, I agree with all, these are very insightful comments. You've been well trained, it's great. But the interesting thing is what we're not expecting. But, it, but if you still are bothered by that, come back to it, okay? So that's what he called perceived nativeness. So these are people, and by that he means these are people who were scoring, they were perceived as native-like speakers, and then they, their performance on these tests was looked at. Then he looked at what he calls scrutinized native-likeness. He retained all of the, uh, the uh, subjects with a, a perceived nativeness score of six or above, which means they were perceived by a majority of the L1 speakers of Swedish to be native-like speakers. 81% uh, were early learners and, not, and 19 were late learners. So he's whittled it down. Uh, and he reduced it to 41 out of the original 192 uh, in order to control for factors like mean, uh, the range in the age of, of um, testing, length of residence, uh, and their amount of exposure. So he wanted to reduce some of the variation that you're pointing out is very problematic when you look at a sample that varies so much in age of acquisition. Um, and he had 15 Swedish L1 speakers. I mean, it's really interesting if you're going to do this research to include native speakers of the language, because it's surprising how often they don't score like native speakers. So that's why that concept is also problematic. And then he gave them this very extensive battery of tests. I won't go into this, but there was a grammatical judgment task. You all know what that is, I assume. Lexical interference, I forget actually what that looked like, semantic. Formulaic language, idioms, um, proverbs, perception of uh, 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 word perception in babble, babble noise, speech perception in white noise. These were all difficult tasks. So here is the interesting slide for me. So this is, the, this is the, among this very select group of, of uh, participants how well they do it in all of these measures. So we're not looking at the general shape, we're looking at actual numbers. So this, the, the line I want you to focus on is really uh, nine and 10. So these numbers refer to in the number of individuals, not the number, but the individuals who scored uh, 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 in the native speaker range, which is not perfect, but it's the same range as the native speaker scored in, on nine or 10 of the tasks. The group that's really interesting to me is the group that acquired, started to acquire Swedish as a native language before five years of age. Only three of them out of 15 in this group scored in the L1 range on nine or 10 of these tasks. Does this surprise you? What does this suggest to you? Are you shocked? <laughs> or are you just tired and you want to go home? <laughs> are you, do you understand what I've done? So what I've done is circle, sorry. So these are the people who scored 
let's look at this uh, red, sir, the group within the red. There were only three people out of 31 in the childhood group who scored native-like on all 10 tasks. Three out of 15 in the really early group scored 9 or 10. So this is a lower selection criteria. But in either case, this is not a lot of people. Because this is the group that should be most likely to score native-like. So these kids, so this is why I was saying your questions were good ones, but uh, the, the thing is that these are the kids who would have had the most exposure to Swedish. They would have had exposure to Swedish in schooling, in their general lives, in, in all sorts of ways. They're still, in many cases, using the native language, but it's a second language. This is really shocking, no? Uh, no. No? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? No, we assume that native speakers are excellent in their native language. No, but we're not talking about excellent or not. We're just saying they're, they're only doing as well as the native speaker, even though the native speakers are not excellent. Yeah, but did we have a sample of native, native speakers tested with the yeah. same tests? Yes, right. With similar backgrounds. Was, was there a test? Yes, that's what, that's what this was about. So they included, where did I have that slide? Yes, they included 15 Swedish L1 participants who were matched to the L2 speakers on age and education. Yeah, but I understand. I mean, it's so disturbing. It's so disturbing you think, oh, there must be something wrong with what he's done. <laughs> now, for somebody like me, who's really been an advocate for early bilingualism and early immersion and all this stuff, this is really shocking to me. I'm, you know what I'm going to do? Uh, one more question, because I want to talk about some of my own research, because I think it's good. <laughs> so who wants the last word before we move on? I've talked about everybody else's research. I want to do some of my own. Yeah. Uh, just to go back to, I guess, Albert's point from earlier on, it still seems to me, though, that if these people in their daily life are passing native speakers, then they are passing as native Swedish speakers, then does it really matter if they're right. not actually passing right. them? Perfectly, perfectly legitimate, but... <laughs> If they're in a school system or if and they're being tested in rigorous ways. So yeah, it's a question of what do we make of these results? How do we interpret them? One more and then I go move on. Couldn't it be that it is not only as early as better, but also kind of critical points? When you have people who are But you can't get much better than this. I mean, before five years of age, they were schooled in Sweden. But let me do my stuff. Okay, so we've, I've, for a number of years, this is research that, uh, that well, I'm not well known for, but we've been looking at children who were internationally adopted children from China. Does anybody know this research? No, this is really interesting research. Um, <laughs> I, I, got interested, I got interested in these children because I wanted to look at what is the full, what is the, are there limits on the capacity of young learners to acquire an additional language? And these children are particularly interesting because they were born in China. They were raised in China for, for, you'll see, for between 12 and 24 months of age. They were then given up for adoption because of the country's uh, one-child uh, policy. So the main reasons for adoption were not, as it is in other countries, not related to drug abuse in the families, the socioeconomic disadvantage, uh, inability to cope with. They, they, they didn't have those disadvantaging conditions. And in fact, children who are given up for adoption in China are often raised in reasonably good or relatively good foster homes or, or institutions. Because the problem is if you've got children who are raised in institutions which have poor quality, then the children are going to su 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 suffer from developmental problems related to inadequate uh, raising. You, you all know the Romanian adoption stuff. I mean, these are horrific conditions. These children, it was really quite good. So, for, for our purposes, what's important is these ch children were adopted by French speaking parents in Quebec. They uh, usually were um, started to learn French between 12 and 20, 24 months of age, because that's when they were given up for, uh, for adoption. And the acquisition of the ink, uh, Chinese stopped at that point. So that's an interesting thing that I want to come back to. Uh, 
French is the only language that they learned subsequent to adoption, and so they're essentially modeling your French speakers. Uh, they have the, the, so what the interesting issues is the normal neurocognitive substrates for L2 learning are, ha, may have been altered because there's growing research that suggests that the first language is very strong, offer very strong support for second language acquisition. So the question is, does losing a first language within the first 12 months of life have, an, have a consequence one way or the other for subsequent language learning? I think if I, if I so I'm going to ask most of you, I've sort of given this away now, how many of you think these children will look just like native speakers of French because they started to learn French for the trial? I should have asked this before. <laughs> Albert's one. Okay, a number of you. How many of you don't think so? How many of you are not sure? Okay. Well, okay, uh, we went in thinking they would look like native speakers, right? But the other issue, is, the other thing that really drew us to this sample is not so much the attrition of the, the home, the birth language, but I was really interested in these children because there's a delay in the acquisition of the first language, and it's a very short delay, but it's a delay nevertheless, but it's a de and it's a delay that has many advantages to it. Now, often these children are thought to be at risk for development in general, but language learning as well, and this is, this is a concern that motivated a lot of the research that was done before we started our research. So one of the problems may be, in general, that the pre-adoption environment may be impoverished socially, cognitively, or linguistically. Um, we don't think that's true in, in these kids' case, but I'll show you why. The, another risk factor may, as I mentioned, they lost the first language, and maybe that undermines the foundations for subsequent language learning. The other possibility, which you would probably not predict, is that delayed onset of the second language is also a risk factor. And part of the reason for thinking that is the study I just talked to you about, right? So we, we set out to do that. Now, at the same time, these children have lots of advantages. They're exposed only to the second language, unlike most second languages. These kids, sometimes their, their new language is referred to as second first language. I mean, I think that's a really good term because it indicates that these kids are as close to a first language learner as you can get when the first language is not a first language. Um, they also are raised in enriched learning environments because parents who adopt children are often fairly affluent because it's expensive to adopt children. They're also very conscientious parents because it's a lot of work to adopt children. These children are also potentially at an advantage because they're from China. The pre-adoption environments are relatively good, and I'll show you evidence for that. And they were mainly girls, and arguably that's uh, an advantage in the early stages, at least. And also, they're within the classic critical period. I mean, I think anybody who thought about this for two seconds would think, these kids have an advantage because they're so young. Okay? Now, I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but a lot of other research had looked at these kids, but it was done mainly by clinicians and mainly in order to establish if these kids were at risk for their language development. There's also been research on their social development, uh, but often what this research did was it looked at these children's performance on standardized tests in English, in most cases, to see whether these kids scored in the normal, in the typical range on English, and when that occurred. Um, the problem is that uh, it did not take into account the fact that these children are actually raised in enriched language environments because these tests do not take into account that their parents are actually from upper middle class backgrounds. So from a theoretical point of view, we're missing an important factor here, right? I mean, from a practical point of view, you might say, who, who cares? But from a language learning theory point of view, you would say to yourself, yeah, but are they learning as much as English or French in this context as children raised in similar environments? Or is there a limit? Um, and these are rather indirect measures of language proficiency. Now, we also use them, but that is a problem. So, so that we looked at these children for many years, actually. We wanted to look, is their acquisition of the adoption language like the L1, or is it like an L2? Uh, do they have the same level of competence as non-adopted children? Or do they show the early effects of delay, which is really what drove my interest in them. And if there are early effects, what, what age effects, what causes those effects? 
So we've done a lot of studies. We initially did research when these kids, I think my, when they were four, year, four years, two months old, and then up all the way up to 13 years, seven months of age, okay? And I'm gonna describe. So the very first one, the kids were, uh, we did test them twice. The first time, they were 41 months of age to 56 months of age, and then we did a follow-up a year later because we were so surprised at our results, we wanted to test the generalizability. Um, what we found, and they were matched to control kids, there were 25 in each group, 24, they were matched to the control group on age, gender, and importantly, socioeconomic status. So this is a really <laughs> interesting issue because it raises a lot of problems and concerns, but we felt like we needed to compare these children to children who are being raised in equally enriched environments if we wanted to really test the true limits of their ability to acquire this language, right? But it's, it gets complicated, all right? So our results in general, in comparison to the control, they scored in the norm, in the typical range, actually, on the test we gave, but they were significantly lower than the control children on expressive vocabulary, expressive and receptive language. This was the self, the comprehensive English language test, and, the, and sentence recall. So I won't go into that in detail, but they, we were surprised. We didn't expect this, because all of the other researchers found that they were in the normal range, and we did too, but in comparison to this control group, they were doing significantly poorer. And I didn't, well, I didn't want to do anything with these data unless we could establish that it wasn't just a one-off set of studies. So we brought all of these kids back one year later. We have a new control group and we found the same results. So then we published them. Because I think that's the other thing. If you're doing this kind of research, frankly, you have to be really careful about the ethical implications of your findings. And you have to be really sure that what you're getting is valid. Because in this, you can imagine in this case, if you're going to report these kinds of results, if, if it's not valid, then it's going to create all sorts of problems for the wrong reasons. It still could have all sorts of adverse effects. But if it's valid, it's important to know. So this, this is just to show you the results of the specific test. If it appears in red, then it means there's a significant difference. And this is striking. They're within the norms, but they're not scoring as well as the controls. So it means that they're not able to do something. So, they're, so it's so what? So, the, so what? They look, they're doing just as well. You're going to regret that you ever said that. They, they, uh, they look just like typically developing model children. But the so what is, but hey, there are environments where they're not doing as well as other children. And one of the women who does a lot of the research on this in the US, she said to me, but this is really important because these children often go to schools. So this is in the US, not Canada. They go to school where there's a lot of high achieving parents and children. And if they don't do as well as the other children, this has social repercussions for these children. I hadn't thought of that, but I thought it was an interesting point. So we did another study uh, when they were uh, in school. I'll show you the sample in a moment. And I wanted, I was particularly interested in doing this, partly because people, every time we tried to publish these results, the researchers and the reviewers said, but of course they're not doing as well as the controls. They've had less exposure than the kids. And we would say, yes, but they've had four or five years. And this comes back to the earlier point. If there really is this critical period, Advantage. It shouldn't take more than five years to show itself, that in my opinion. But anyway, in order to address that, we decided we would do a follow-up when they were in elementary school. And I was particularly interested to see whether the enrichment, the language enrichment they would get in school would maybe boost their performance up. Because arguably in school they're getting a very enriched language environment, right? Whereas in the home, often these kids are single children because their parents haven't been able to have children of their own. So maybe the language environment is not as enriched, although it's probably richer than most kids get. So we wanted to really test that out. So all you need to know is that the age of testing now is 9 to 12 years of age, and they're in grades 4 to 7 in our system. Their length of exposure to French had been 80 months. So that's quite long, right? And again, they were matched to control children in all the same ways. Right? Here's the results. Here's the, anything in red means there's a significant difference. So, so what's important about this is 
the test, we gave them a, we gave them a lot of control tests. We never find any differences on cognitive ability or social emotional adjustment or attachment. That's just to show that. The receptive vocabulary was fine and just as good as controls. Reading comprehension was fine and so was word association, but they're significantly lower on receptive grammar, word definitions, expressive vocabulary, and recalling sentences. And this is particularly interesting because they were also below the norms on sentence recall. How many of you are in kind of clinical areas of language? Sentence recall task is a very simple test where you, and if you're doing individual different stuff, it's a great test. The kids are simply asked to recall verbatim sentences that you speak to them. And they get more, longer and more complex. So you say, the dog is sleeping. The child repeats the dog is sleeping. The dog is sleeping beside the cat. The dog is sleeping. It's not the same frame, but the dog is sleeping beside the cat that has, is on the mat. So it gets more complex. And you simply see how many of these sentences they get right. It's used as a, an indicator of the possibility of specific language impairment. It correlates with a lot of things. So it's a very useful omnibus measure. So this was really interesting to us. Right. Just to show you what their performance looks like in more detail, we're, this is the percentage of children in the uh, internationally adopted group who scored at the same level as the controls. So this is between minus and plus one standard deviation. So this is, tip, this is what you'd expect. But this is the number of kids who are between minus one and minus two standard deviations below the control group. And this is the number of kids who are, percentage of kids who are more than two standard deviations below the number. This is high. Very few of them are scoring better than the control group. Now, this is, this is skewed because this is a very high performing control group. But these kids have had the same kinds of experiences as these kids, more or less, right? Okay, so then what we decided, so the question is, what's going on here? Why are these kids doing less well? It could be that the pre-adoption uh, environment is adverse for these kids. We don't think so. We didn't think so because their cognitive ability is high, social emotional adjustment is high, their medical condition is fine, and they're scoring in the normal range on these tests. So there's no indication that there really is some kind of developmental delay problem. Perhaps not enough exposure, but by now they've had 80 months of exposure to French only in very enriched environments. So it's still possible there are exposure issues, but gee, this is really pushing the limits of how much exposure you need to be proficient in the language. Um, could be schooling, but we've tested them in schooling, so that's not a fact. So there's two factors. One is attrition of the first language. It could be because they've lost their first language, they have a, a weak base for acquiring French as a second language. But it could also be that they have uh, uh, a verbal memory difficulties, as indicated by the performance on that test, OK? So, uh, and there's lots of research that shows that verbal memory, working memory, and short-term memory is related to language development in a lot of different domains, in first language acquisition, second language acquisition. I won't go into that. It's a really interesting area of research. So we did yet another study. Again, uh, we had uh, IA children, control children, matched on SES and so forth and so on. At this point, they've had nine and a half years exposure to French, um, and they were in grades four to six. None had repeated a grade. So they're doing well in school. And their schooling has been entirely in French. Here's the results. Here's the control measures. No significant differences on. The, this is a nonverbal measures of cognitive ability but in the Wexler. No differences. Here's the language abilities. Significantly, they're within the norm on three of them, but below the norm on two. First time they've been below the norm on a language test, per se. And they're significantly lower the control group on all of these. Here's the, verb, here's the real interesting results. The verbal memory scores of these children are within the norms in most cases, but they're significantly lower than the controls. But their nonverbal memory is fine, which is really amazing. Uh, just to give you an indication of what's happening with their language, here is the percentage of children, IA children, who scored more than one standard deviation below the controlled children at seven years of age and then at 10 years of age. What do you notice? 
from seven to ten years of age. Their performance is getting poorer, not better. That's really striking. Because you'd think the more exposure they have, they should get better. And children get better. Now again, this is a very high performing control group. So our theory was that verbal memory might be the underlying issue here. So we did some regression analyses. Does everybody know what a regression analysis? It's really a fancy correlation. And what we <laughs> um, that's what I told my statistics students, and then they relaxed. <laughs> so when we went, we put in a bunch of measures, including short-term memory working memory, and other, uh, and other correlates like age of uh, adoption, length of exposure, stuff like that. And interestingly, and we ran these correlation uh, regression analyses for the IA children and the control children separately. The, for the IA children, remember these children were almost 10, uh, 8 or 9 years of age, the short-term memory tasks were significant predictors of their performance on the measures that they scored significantly lower on. For the control children, exposure or age was significant. This is what you'd expect. For children who are learning the first language, short-term memory and working memory are significant predictors, but only up to a certain point in their late years of age, and then age becomes more significant because it's not short-term memory doesn't influence language development. What happens is language development improves short-term and working memory for reasons I won't get into. But anyway, this gave us some cause for concern. Or it, it at least pointed us into what might be the issues for these children. Now, so the, so the, the data point in this direction, that either the attrition of the first language is the problem or delayed exposure to the altruism is the issue. We don't know from these children because we can't separate delay in exposure to French and their attrition of the language, right? Because the delay is caused by attrition. Right? And that they, and one or two of these is why they're doing poorly in verbal memory. And our argument would be, if you're exposed to a second language as, much, as little as 12 months of age, then your verbal memory for the new language is not as good as that of children who have been exposed to that language from birth, because the delay is influencing uh, language development through its effects on mem verbal memory. Cause, because uh, memory, we're all born with the capacity to remember. Otherwise, how could you learn? But memory it ha has to be primed. So it's memory for something. Memory for spatial information, memory for acoustic information, memory for language. So most theories of cognitive development, when they talk about memory, they distinguish between spatial memory, visual spatial memory, and acoustic or auditory uh, linguistic information, right? So our theory was the delay that these children experience in their exposure to French has, in a sense, altered their verbal memory for French in comparison to monolingual native speakers, and that is that sets off cascading effects on their acquisition of French as a second first language, and these effects actually get larger because because Weaknesses early on create larger problems later on. That's the hypothesis. But maybe it's attrition of the first language. Because all okay. right. So here's where it gets really interesting. And so we decided as a student, Laura Pierce, who wanted to do uh, some brain research. So we uh, collaborated with Denise Klein from the Montreal Neurological Institute to look at do some scans with these children. Now at this stage, they're about 13 years of age. There's, we were able to recruit 23 children. These are new uh, adolescents, really. Uh, we're 23 years of age. And we also, uh, con we also recruited 13 monolingual French speakers the same age. And this is the really brilliant part of the study. I can say this because it was Lara who did this, decided on this group. We had Chinese French bilingual children. So these are children uh, who were born in Montreal live with Chinese-speaking parents, learn Chinese as a first language, at, and then began to learn French as a second language at the same age as the adopted children. Because it's very common in Montreal for immigrant children to begin to learn French very early on, because they go to daycare centers or home care centers, which are French. Right? 
So those are the three groups. So the inclusion of this group allows us to disentangle, I think I'm what, allows us to disentangle attrition from delay because these two groups both experience delay, but only the IA children experience attrition. You're following them? So that was a really nice thing. So we did two studies with them. One was, uh, and this attracted a lot of attention, we wanted to see if there were any remnants of Chinese in these children's brains to be crossed. So we ran a study in a scanner uh, where they simply ha they heard pseudo words in uh, Chinese that uh, either were the same in tone or different in tone. So as you probably know, uh, differences in tone are phonemic in Chinese. Is it, could somebody give me an example of a, who's Chinese speaking here? No, okay. Yeah. An example of a word where the tone changes and it changes the meaning of the word. Can you pronounce those? <laughs> No, no, use the variations in ma. Ma, ma. Okay. I mean, that sounds the same to me. I don't know about you, but it's not. It's that the difference between saying mother and horse, right? Because the, because the ah sound, the tone changes, the meaning of the word changes. It doesn't matter in French or English what the tone is, all right? They just simply have to say same or different. Right? So we ran the kids. Um, and interestingly enough, the performance of all three groups behaviorally was the same. So the monolingual kids could discriminate just as well as the bilingual kids or the adopted kids. There was no difference in performance. Um, and here's the performance of the bilingual kids. I don't know why, I'm just going to put them all up. Should I allow people to leave now? Sure. You can leave if you want. But I bet you want to see the day. No? <laughs> so here's the... Here's, so this is a Chinese task. The, so, and and uh, unfortunately, people who do this kind of research has a very perverse habit of uh, uh, representing uh, left on the right and right on the left. Sometimes, but not always. So in this case, uh, the left part of the brain is on the right side and the right part of the brain is on the left. So in the, in the monolinguals, because it's a Chinese sound discrimination task, they can do the task. But the area of the brain that's doing the task is in the right hemisphere. So they're using non-linguistic areas of the brain that are typically associated with non-language process. <coughs> the bilingual children who speak Chinese as a first language, they're using left hemisphere brain regions. Right? So what do you think the IA children are going to do? Are they going to look like the monolinguals because they're monolingual in French? Or they're going to look like the bilinguals because they used to speak. They started to get Chinese, but then they stopped. How many think they'll look like monolingual French? How many think they'll look like the bilinguals? So if they look like the bilinguals, what does that mean? They retain Chinese, at least, right? And that's what happened. So after ten, and this was after 10 to 12 years of no exposure to Chinese, there are traces of Chinese in the way they perform this task. And this is an example of what uh, Jubin was saying, that the behavioral results and the, um, uh, the neuroimaging results don't coincide. Because they could all do the task, but they did it in different ways. For the monolingual kids, they're doing it as an acoustic discrimination task, and for the bilinguals and the international adoptees, they're performing it as a linguistic task. Does that mean they're predisposed to relearn Chinese? Well, that would be an interesting thing to do, that maybe they would learn Chinese, at least Chinese phonology, more readily than people who had never been exposed to Chinese. Now, you, if you want to leave, please feel free, because I've run out of time. But I have one more study associated with this group, and this is really the best study. But you, can, <laughs> but you can leave. You can leave. I don't know your name, so I can't send you that email. Um, commenting on the question, if uh, people can relearn their own language, I Uh, uh, I think it were Korean LFTs 
uh, adults who got the training to relearn their uh, birth language, and they were able to do that, whereas the, the controls weren't Correct. able to right. do it. And Kelton, and Kelton Shannon has done something similar. Let me do the next piece, because it is it is really interesting. This just shows you the areas of overlap between the, uh, the, 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 the adopted children and the, um, the bilinguals. The, here's another interesting result. We did correlations between their involvement of these er this uh, language area of the brain and their age at adoption. So this is in months. So this is the age at which they were adopted, and this is the extent to which uh, there was, now how do I interpret this? This is the extent to which there was involvement of the linguistic areas of the brain for processing this task. So what you see is that the older they were at adoption, the more their brain uh, results were like that of the native speakers of Chinese. So exposure made a difference. It really what it implies is that the more <coughs> ingrained... So remember that I talked about this uh, fi phonetic fine-tuning thing? So this is a period when fine-tuning occurs. So what this is suggesting is that even though they were not producing Chinese in many cases, at, during this period of development, their system was going from this language general uh, organization to specific to Chinese, and it gets locked in, and it gets, and it gets more, it's more native like the more exposure they have to Chinese. Okay. Now, the next study, which is really the one that I wanted to do, uh, was to look at how they process French, their second language. Because for me, the question, based on what we had seen in the behavioral uh, results, was, well, what are they doing with French? I mean, surely, from a critical period point of view, these kids should be using the same kind of strategies, neurocognitive areas of the brain as monolingual, because that's what the critical period hypothesis says. The younger you are, and especially if you're within that critical period, you're doing it during a period when there's a lot of critical uh, plasticity, and you should be able to uh, engage the same area of the brain as if you were a monolingual speaker, maybe speaker. So they, they did this, in this case, same group of girls, they stayed on and we did this task, it was an in-back task. So they were given uh, uh, words in French uh, that, uh, and they had to identify uh, if they had heard the word in the preceding trial, in the tr trial one, two behind that, and so on. So it's a, wor it's, a, it's a working memory task for French sounds because you have to remember the sound and you have to remember when it occurred. We'll just say that for a moment. Here are the results. Here's the monolingual French speakers. So this is the real reference point. And, there, and here left is left, <laughs> just to confuse you. So they're using left areas of the brain, as you would imagine. I haven't gone into the specific areas that they engage, but here they are. Here's the bilinguals. So they're engaging left, air, uh, left hemisphere regions, but also some right hemisphere regions. So what do you think the adopted kids are going to do? Look like the monolinguals or the bilinguals? Bilinguals. That's what happened. So even though they have begun to learn French between 12 and 24 months of age, even though it's the only language that they've learned, and even though there's no longer interference from Chinese, they're actually using the same underlying... I mean, this is a bit of speculation because there's a, a lot that we don't know, but just to play this story out. They seem to be, the, they, they're processing this language like a second language. And uh, the argument would be that the retaining these traces of, uh, of Chinese, probably related to phonological memory, when they come to learn French, then they have to build French on a system that's really set up to learn Chinese. So that's why they look like the bilinguals, right? So we did a connectivity analysis. This is a kind of analysis that, uh, that allows you to look at what area of the brains are interconnected during the processing of the, in this task. So we ran this for the French monolinguals. And, what, and you have a seed area, seed region, so you pinpoint one area that you want to be the focal 
tip point of attention. And here was the left insula, because this is um, involved in working memory studies. And we wanted to see whether what other areas of the brain were activated at the same time that you get activation of the insula. And it turns out that the other areas of the brain that were activated were areas of, uh, of a circuit which are thought to be involved in phonological memory in monolinguals, all right? So that's kind of what you expect. When you, we looked at the bilingual and the IA children, uh, there, we couldn't find any uh, significant connections, but for the uh, IA children, there was, there was connectivity with the right frontal pole and the right uh, middle frontal gyrus. These are not areas, apparently, that are typically associated with phonological memory. We can show these areas to, these results to June. In other words, the, the, the results for the monolinguals are, as we had hypothesized, uh, engaging a classical phonological working memory um, system. But the second language learners, at least these kids who have lost their first language, uh, are not. Now, the implication is that this is due to delay and not attrition because we're not getting differences between the bilinguals and the adoptees. Now, one final thing that's really interesting is there was a they did a comparison where you look at the task when it's simple. You just have to identify every time you hear a target sound and compared that to when they heard the sound two steps back. So the idea here is that by uh, looking at uh, memory for sounds that occurred two steps back, this is probably demanding because you have to hold the sound in memory and you have to track what's happening in between and so forth and so on. So the question is, when you increase the cognitive load, how do the monolinguals do, deal with this and what do the bilinguals do and the IA children? For the French monolinguals, uh, there was very little engagement of other areas of the brain. There was some, but it was relatively minor. In other words, this was not a significant increase in cognitive load for the uh, participants. Interestingly, for the bilinguals and the internationally adopted children, there was increased activity in regions which are associated with attention, attention and cognitive control. So the argument is, and we talked about this with Eugen's talk, is that because they retained aspects of the Chinese, both the bilinguals obviously and the adopted kids, they can't use exactly the same strategies uh, the IA kids can't use exactly the same strategies, so they, they use these, co what we call compensatory strategies, to do, perform this task. And those are regions that are not strictly language related, but they're related to more general cognitive processing. Okay. Now this is pretty, so the argument is that delay in exposure to the L2 produces difference in phonological working memory, and that influences their language develop. So the question then is, so what? <laughs> I mean, really, these kids are acquiring a second language under ideal situations, somewhat like Hilton Stones, but they're not, you know, and they, admittedly this is esoteric testing, but what does it tell us in terms of theories of language acquisition? And it should, for people like me, it sort of shakes me up because I wanted them to look like the monolinguals. It's not necessarily about language acquisition, but there was one very In the in this sample. Well, it could be. Yeah. It, it, we don't know what the mechanism, but there's something, arguably, the traces of, Chine of Chinese are somehow or other influencing processing of French. It could be inhibition, potential interference, but it could be something else that those, that capacity to remember phonological information is not entirely well suited for French because it's set up for Chinese, so they're using other mechanisms to get around it. Well, no, but remember, phonological fine tuning means that you narrow your perception of contrast. So, 
It should make French easier. Exactly. But it doesn't. So it may not be the... Exactly. So that might be not probable. But, uh, so we can exclude all genetic explanations. I think so. I mean, other people have said, how do we know these kids are not genetically different? But I can't imagine. All of them are different. Yeah. And we've had repeat, different samples yeah, of them. Exactly. And do we say that these Chinese kids are genetically different? I don't want to say that. <laughs> no, do we want to say adopted no, kids are different? Well, but these kids were given up for adoption because of the policies of the country, and, and it's usually related. It's not that they're entirely, their home environments so were entirely perfect, but it's certainly really far from extremely adverse. I think that's one of the twins that are people in different Anyway, the problem is to be very interesting and important because one problem we have found in the first was in Europe with children who arrive from other countries is that they are forbidden to Well, there is a lot of research that shows that uh, strong first language skills support the acquisition of the yes, second. Yes, in the other way, but not what does mean when you come to the shop and still, right, let's right, say, right. first Yes. Yeah, now take me, take me back to, uh, this is very, very interesting, you take me back to the Swedish research, because this is really important for talking about influence and education and policy. Because there's always this belief that the older the children are alive, the better they get. But you take away the, the mother language in so many of these cases. Yeah, but you see, this research is not actually implying attrition. Because no, my language. No. Uh, but, but it, yeah, it, it, but it, I think it's well, it means that even earlier, they're always going to be different. And the fact that they're doing just as well behaviorally as a, as a typically developing group means that there's a kind of neuroplasticity that can be used to reach those levels of proficiency. Yes. Which is true of se uh, typical second language learners. Because remember, the bilingual kids are typically, in every other respect, they show the same brain results. So it's not, yes, these so groups there really wasn't. Evidence that there's some Chinese with them. Right. And, and I assume that this makes sense since it's their first Well, but the, the Chinese bilingual kids are 13 years of age. All of them are, th so they're pretty far along the way. And they're living in Chinese families. A lot of them were in China. I mean, the, the control group is a pretty typical group of second language learners. So I think that what this says is that all second language learners are going to show, they're not going to be the same as monolinguals. And we shouldn't expect them to. There's nothing wrong with that. That's just the way it is. It's normal for these children to look different in certain respects because they're using different strategies related to neurocognitive development as a result of their language history. So in other words, if they do show differences, although these kids are not showing differences with respect to uh, test norms. So it says that, look, these kids are very good at acquiring normal levels of performance. But when you look at them more in detail, they're doing it in a different way. No. That's the, that's the sticky part. 
who have learned, but then they wouldn't be adopted children. <laughs> Well, that's pretty odd. <laughs> because... <laughs> no, but then they're going to look like the bilingual kids. Then you've got bilingual kids. But if it's the adoption, most research shows that adoption is a pos positive experience for children. They improve in everything, usually. Anyway, thank you for your patience. Something to think about. <laughs>